You can be amazed. You can take senior clinicians and lose them in moulage if it's accurate enough. Really, really lose them. Um, because you can just mimic that level of realism. But put the wound in the wrong place with silly patterning around it, mm-hmm. spraying too much blood, mm-hmm. and it just screams instantly false. Yeah. And then you lose that whole effect of raising their adrenaline level and, and immersing them in the world of simulation. <laughs> This evening's podcast is brought to you by <laughs> Brewdog Dead Pony Club Indian Pale Ale. Um, mm, one of my favourite. Nothing tipples. like a, nothing like carbonated pony. Yeah. So Brewdog, uh, it's it's. I think they're a Glaswegian brewer, um, but they're fantastic. Yeah, they're very good. So I'm, I'm I'm sipping one of these beers left over. I don't drink a lot of beer. I don't typically keep it in the house. But we've had some fantastic yeah. weather. We had some neighbours and friends over for. Uh, you know, a barbecue, so I got a load of beers in, and this was the excess. So I feel it my duty to remove it from the refrigerator, can by can. Of course, on yes. A daily basis to try and reduce that. So that's what that's all about. Remove so. temptation from the rest of the family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those kids can really knock it back, and they don't appreciate it. So. <laughs> yeah, so um, so that's what I'm doing. And I'm then, still pretty alcohol free. Yeah. Yeah. Are you enjoying that or do you uh, – No, you... <laughs> I, I, would, I would love to be able to uh, down a, a few cocktails every now and then and okay. still just alcohol and blood thinners don't mix. Okay. Well, so. when, when you get off of those, we'll, 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 uh, we'll, I'll come to you and we'll, we'll hit some bars and do that. Hell yeah. <laughs> that sounds good to me. Colorado is just up the road really, isn't it? It's the beauty of air travel. Yeah, well, we need to get you over here so we can do some workshops. People are clamoring for um, the battles with bits of rubber workshop tour. That'd be fun. Yeah, I'd like to do that. That'd be really good. Um, And we got um, the website... It, it it took a, a bit of a not a nosedive, but it just it just kind of clammed up for a bit because the lady that's doing it all was sick and it all got a bit weird and I wasn't sure what was happening. But it's all fine, so it's it is happening, so that's good. But which is good because it, things have kicked off work wise for me. I'm doing um uh, I'm working on a on a a, a TV adaptation of Dracula, which is going to be mm-hmm. out in New Year's. It's is that what the age makeup? You're sculpting right no, now? No, no, that's for IMAX. For? That's for uh, IMAX. Oh. I've been putting pictures out of that. But no, the Dracula stuff, naturally, I can't talk about because I've signed NDAs and stuff. But uh, but yeah, that should be that should be a fun thing that comes out, I think, New Year's, Christmas, New Year's time. So so that'll be out there. Yeah, I'll keep an eye out for that. So that's good, but that's taken up all my time, and I'll be going back to that like tomorrow. So, so yeah. So, uh, but the IMAX thing is really kicking my ass because it's one of those things where I I, I, I plan to do more of it, as you always do, and then stuff happens. Mm-hmm. Jobs land in my lap, things happen, and then I end up going to Canada and blah blah blah, and it was all good. And then suddenly I'm like, oh shit, we've only got a month, and I'm still sculpting it. So like, I need to get this done. So, yeah, I preach into the choir, Bubba. Yes, I see you posting up pictures totally of the and stuff it. that you're doing. So you've been making yeah, I've, not I've, small things I've either. I've got a <laughs> big production of Beauty and the Beast uh, opens on May the 4th. And it's a long run. It runs from May 4th through close to the end of September. Oh, my gosh. So I've got to build things to last because while it's a regional theater production and they've got a budget – it's not a huge budget, so mm. prosthetics have to last the run. But the way I've I've designed the beast is it's it's a I don't I don't worry about about seam lines or you know, or, or edges because the fur cowl gets to cover everything. And nice. I've got two two hero pieces that should last the run, and uh, there's a, a I don't want to say a stunt double, but there's a, a double that they use at the beginning of the show. So I've got three pieces uh, all sculpted to fit the actor who's who's playing the part. So mm-hmm. shouldn't need any adhesive, but if they want to do a few little spot glue-down points. And uh, it's soft silicone, so it's going to move really nicely, be able to emote. Uh, but there's a, a lot to build. Yeah. And they go into tech end of this week so i uh, got 
got to get my shit together. Oh my gosh. And do you, are you, but task- I'm almost, I'm, I'm almost ready. Oh, that's good. Are you, have you, are you responsible for maintaining it as well in between shows or is that something they do themselves or is the idea that they that's something that it? they'll, they'll do themselves. If it needs any repair work, then I, I'll, I'll get my hands on it and, and fix it. But, uh, mm. I've, I've built power mesh into the pieces so that it makes it much more tear resistant. Mm-hmm. You know, power mesh is great stuff. Yeah. And they just real, look, look real stretchy. <laughs> got to look after yep. it. <laughs> That's part of their yeah. job is to not screw it up. So we'll go. Yeah, we'll go through some some instruction on how to how to put stuff on, how to take it off, how to how to take care of it, mm-hmm. and should be fine. And I'm working with a costumer that I love working with. Uh, we've we've done this show together uh, in the past with another theater company, so. We have our communication down pretty pat. Excellent stuff. Oh, man, that sounds like a fun thing. It's just been kicking yeah. your ass a bit. And when does that – that finishes May 4, so you, you are up until then. Yeah, I've got to, I've got to be done by the end of this week okay. so that they can – so they can go in a full dress, full costume, full dress with it all. Okay. Well, amazing. Well, there we go. Yeah. Um, so, a little bit of word about uh, today's guest. Uh, where I, I had a chat with a guy called Paul Savage, who's a medical chap who knows a thing or two about. It was one thing. great. It was great listening to, to to you guys talk because it brought back a lot of my pre makeup. Yes, I was thinking back, that uh, my 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 paramedic. Uh, well, I was an EMT, but uh, brought back a lot of a lot of. Interesting memories. Yeah, I can imagine you would, because I was thinking, you know, the, it's that crossover of, of, of medical knowledge with, you know, the makeup thing, um, because it, the two go quite well together. There's quite a few people I know who are through nursing or doctor, or, you know, that kind of medical thing that they make for good makeup artists when it comes to sort of casualty simulation because they <laughs> they know it quite well. You know, you know what stuff like, looks like. Know what stuff looks like. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk to him was because he. I, he kind of flagged it up as a, as a, as a, as an interesting thing because he had taught on, um, on a, on a, like a, like a module for, for some college students, uh, the casualty bit of their course, the casualty makeup course. And, um, he was quite surprised how little the students on there knew about, you know, the medical side of things, which most courses, a degree of anatomy and physiology that's involved in it. But, he was quite surprised how much there wasn't. And, you know, I think he's quite right. There's a lot of people that perhaps learn about the makeup side of things, but they don't really, they're not directed to good reference and how to, to approach making wounds look correct and staging them correctly and all that kind of stuff. So he thought it'd be a good idea. And I agreed entirely. I was like, yeah, let's do it. So we hooked up and it took a a few months to get organized, but we actually sat down for an hour or so and actually had a good old chat, which is the result. You know, this is the result. So it was a good chat. I really enjoyed listening to it. In fact, I I went up on his website afterwards and, and was looking at, at some of the, the the encapsulated silicone, excuse me, silicone pieces that he's offering and realized He's he's using um, some of the molds that I had yep. sold to Guru Makeup Emporium, and it was really cool to see see pieces made yep. from from stuff that I sculpted, and made yeah, me feel absolutely. good. That cool. Absolutely, he thinks well, my stuff looks, great because, looks pretty uh, realistic. You know, like I said, we did that whole podcast about you shooting up meat, <laughs> which was. <laughs> An interesting one. <laughs> Shooting up meat. Um, Shooting yeah, up no, meat. Does, uh, yep. He, 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 you know, he'll, he'll, he does all that kind of stuff. But the, I mean, the makeup side of things is obviously important, but it's the medical use of it and you know how how it's interacted with. Because uh, one thing that he mentions, um, not that I get into it now, but he does mention, <laughs> and this is one of those things that crops up enough is the use of wax in medical simulation, um, because obviously. Mm-hmm. Because uh, well, the, oh, the, the trouble wax. is when you're when you touch it, obviously it gets damaged, and a lot of medical simulation people might, might get wax in for the people to use. Because sometimes what happens is the people who are organising the event are not the people who are doing the makeup, so they organise it. They're buying a bunch of things that they've had before, mm-hmm. or that they think they need because scar wax is used for making scars. Or whatever. So they get it in, and then people use it, and then what happens is you've got five medics or five scenarios who've got to go through staunching a wound, you know, putting a dressing on a wound and using pressure um, to, to close up a wound. And of course, if it's made of wax, it gets damaged, and so you know that's why things. Like silicon are quite good, and if they have to peel exactly. up a dressing, so he, the wax you know, comes off with the dressing. That, that happens, but so you know, this is just 
something that happens with that kind of thing. But it's just that there are lots of things that don't necessarily occur to you from a maker point of view unless you've been involved in the scenarios. Like somebody having hang-ups about their body. And like one of the things, if someone's got, someone's volunteered to be a, a casualty, you know, one of the first things they'll do if, is, is to check the whole body. If they're going to represent someone who's unconscious, for example, they might not know where all the injuries are. They'll cut you down to nothing. You know, they'll cut all your clothes off, probably for the scenario down to your underwear, but literally they, they cut the clothes off. Quite literally. To search the body for yeah. wounds so they can ascertain whether or not it's a serious injury. So if someone's got a hang up about, you know, their belly or whatever, or tan lines or whatever, they may go, oh, oh no, I don't want that. I mean, that's not cool for me. And, and those are kinds of things from a makeup point of view. If you're used to dealing with professional models or actors who are being paid handsomely for that discomfort, now with a lot of medical scenarios, they tend to be, you know, uh, nice people who are just offering their time up to help out who may not realize what they're getting into. So it's kind of, there's a whole other mm -hmm. side of things other than makeup, which as a makeup artist, you'll be responsible for. And I think a lot of makeup artists will consider or get involved in some degree of casualty simulation simply because it's a very good and useful avenue to practice your skills and be of use. You know, if you can't get on a movie because they're hard to get onto, you might help out some, you know, first aid groups or something. So it's possible more people do that. It's definitely a, a different mindset uh, involved in, in, casualty s s scenarios uh, where you're doing the moulage i've i've done some stuff for homeland security here in the in the states um and as well as a, a paramedic training com uh program with with one of the hospitals here in here in denver um where you'll get a brief where you see what what the scenario is going to be and what the wound has to look like and then it needs to be created but there's a lot to think about beyond just applying a wound in the proper proper place. You know, some of these things need to need to bleed or they need to bubble air, depending on what things are. And if it's not truly accurate, there's a good chance that something might get misdiagnosed by by the, yes. the trainees who yeah. are looking at it. That they'll they'll think they're looking at something other right. than what it's supposed <laughs> to be because yeah yeah you it wasn't prepared properly or or it wasn't wasn't um, adhered right it was it was below the nipple or you know below the the rib cage and you know you got to understand what the anatomy is like underneath our exterior to be able to get mm. those things that are wrong yeah, no, it's fine. right. And I loved listening to, to Paul explain all these little nuances. It was really, really interesting to me. Yeah, well, for for example, people think think that our mm. lungs are much bigger than they yeah, actually they are. Tub, like you said, up under the rib cage, and also, you know, used to seeing wounds portrayed on TV that are not realistic. You have these big blood sprays, things like, and I've been responsible for it myself. Things like Game of Thrones, which doesn't really happen. But <laughs> which, the thing is, which just doesn't that's happen. Not what you're asked for within the context of a story. Because if there are dragons flying around and there are these big flamboyant characters and a giant, you know, and a bunch of zombies. We've left the realms of reality so that in that context, it's quite excusable that, you know, blood sprays 20 feet across the room. Um, but that's not necessarily what actually happens in reality, as you know, as you'll hear Paul explain. But um, so it's interesting. And often the other thing I thought was really funny that he mentions is that medics think their job is like casualty, you know, where, you know, they're going to be like resuscitating people and sticking pens in people's throats to get them to breathe on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. But like he says, you know, most jobs, they're just multi-pathology patients with illness. You know, he said that there are like 10,000 jobs in London a day, you know, and like maybe 12 resuscitations in a day out of those 10,000 jobs. Most of them are just elderly people or disoriented, drunk, druggy type effect. Do you know what I mean? Just, 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 just you know, managing stuff. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. You know, these flamboyant, it's, exciting. It's not yeah, as glamorous so, as they make it of, appear on television. A lot of medics are like, no, I thought it was going to be like, <laughs> like ER. He's like, nah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that guy just was, threw up on me. As hands it seems to find. Um, but yeah, we'll look at that. So it's worth checking out Paul Savage's <laughs> website, Savior Medical. Uh, I pulled it up actually on here just to read it out. It's saviormedical.com. Um, but I'll put the links in the show notes as well. The other thing that we refer to about with reference as well, I just want to mention 
I've got it here. It's the Special Effects Guide of Real Human Wounds and Injuries by uh, created by Benito Garcia. Uh, I'll put a link for that up as well. That's a, a worthy mm-hmm. tome. It's got some really, really yeah, good Yeah, I've got a copy it of that. Because, again, it's pretty good. Very, you know, they're real. And often, the thing is, people want the drama of it, so you tend to go for the more visual stuff, but it's quite nice to know what the real stuff is. And sometimes things, things that are real you know, can look very fake as well. That's the other thing I think is that sometimes you see real swellings that actually look quite fake and you have to kind of cross reference what's real with what people are expecting and what kind of looks like it might be fake. Because the thing is, if you're doing a makeup, it is fake. So if you do something that you have a picture of Mm -hmm. that looks fake and say, Oh yeah, but it's real. Look at this picture of the real thing. It's like, yeah, but that's real to maybe a medic, but to most people it looks fake. So if you do it, you know, it's going to look fake. So you, sometimes you need to dial things back to a realistic thing or to what people are expecting. Because if you just ruthlessly say, well, I've got a reference picture of that. It's like, yeah, but unless you're going to show that to everyone, um, it could just look a bit, do you know what I mean? You've got to have two sets of eyes. You've got to have the, 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 the you know, the, the set that you've got to see it from the audience yeah, well, point of view, which you're going to accept things a little, perhaps more. Yeah. There's reality and there's camera reality. Exactly. You need to know which is which and, and, and which is worth dialing up. Um, his, his list of things, because I, I put on, on the, the show notes as well, his, uh, his realistic medical moulage for simulation purposes. It, it's just a list of notes like the correct wound that looks accurate, um, you know, that bleeds the right amount, making sure that skin tones are accurate, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Actor compliance, which was something that I hadn't really considered that I hadn't really considered before, which is like, you know, pre-briefing the simulation to somebody that then they know about what they're sensitive of, all that kind of stuff. Um, also pre-brief um, the trauma team so that they cut down correctly because they may just get all excited and cut everything off. Because <laughs> yeah. if you're in charge of the makeup, you might also be in control of, of what the medics have got to do, which is perhaps a level of directorship that most makeup artists are not prepared to take on. Like, well, I didn't have to tell them that they can't do that because they love, you know, going in with the pericis and stripping everything down to show to their examiners that they're doing it right, you know. That's mm-hmm. uh, and also setting the scene as well, supplying the appropriate props. Um, dress in the scene oh, yeah. and if, to if make the, the mechanism injury look if right. If the victim is a is a pretty good actor, that can really help sell the sell the wound beyond the physical appearance of it. Is how they're whether they're crying or you know hysterical in some other way, you know, grabby and mm-hmm. it's, their their performance really plays into it. So there's a lot of detective work on the on the part of the trainee trying to figure out what's what's going on because. There may not be any physical outward signs of of injury, but how the the victim is behaving or not behaving can can speak volumes to to the diagnosis. Yes, because they've also got to respond to treatment as well, um, and you know that's that's quite a tough thing I think to be able to perform accurately in that circumstance, especially when you're close up one to one with someone's trying to help you. You know, it is a simulation, but at the same time you've got to within the confines of that story behave in a realistic way so it shouldn't be underestimated the performance aspect of it yeah, no that can it. it can definitely get when you can get inside the head of both the trainee and and the victim you know the mm. fact that it's they they know they're doing a, a simulation but they can actually forget that it's a simulation if it's realistically portrayed mm. yeah which is amazing because that's part of their training, isn't it? It's to deal with the emotions of it. Yep. So, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll cut to uh, to, to our, my chat with Paul then. Uh, so, have a listen to this and see what you think. It's yeah. Let us know. It's we love it. Stuff. Did I show you the Sick Rose as well? Did we cover that book? That's a great book. That's like medical illustration. Sorry, I'm just giving you all these things. <laughs> um, and it's like a history of um, medical illustration. You know, how do you show what yellow fever looks why, like? Why? In... Why do I open that? <laughs> <laughs> why is that the page it actually opens to? Is there a reason for that? <laughs> it's my favorite. Um, but yeah, you want to see yellow fever in Japan in 1500? Well, you know. That's put me off my dinner now. <laughs> yeah. But from a makeup point of view, it's nice because they're renderings of things rather than photographs yep so someone had to interpret it and turn it into color and okay, yeah. very clever very neat syphilis nice so that's what henry VIII looked like before he died probably tertiary syphilis a face like a caved in floor <laughs> be like do you fancy a bit tonight love <laughs> <laughs>
No, maybe not. No, you're good. Well, I'll, I'll put a, a, a sheep's bladder on <laughs> or whatever, tied off with a bit of fucking sash cord. Ugh. You know what? I'm glad I ate it before I looked at that book. Yeah, it's good. <clears throat> it's a good, a good old read. But um, they're lovely books, though. Yeah, that one was quite cheap. I had it years ago and I lost it. And then someone's mentioning something and I remembered, oh, yeah, I remember that book. I looked it up and found it and just bought it again. Yeah, it's way better. <coughs> So there we go. <clears throat> so, I guess we we want to discuss um, anatomy from a makeup point of view, particularly with a an emphasis on on a lo- uh, an area of makeup which uh, a fair few people I think have had experience with, but it's it's creating casualty simulation scenarios. Um, organizations that do this thing that have the staff that need to be trained emergency services and then a lot of people will perhaps be who involved in makeup will go towards it and we've been having chats about things that are commonly just done wrong like clinically incorrect and how that can impact things and i think uh well, I guess we should start with who you are, Paul, and what you do, and why the hell we should listen to what you've got to say. <laughs> yeah, okay. I wouldn't. I'd switch off now, but no. Um, you so, know a thing or two about a thing or two? Yeah, my name's, my name's Paul, Paul Savage, and I've um, been in and around the hospital and pre-hospital arena now for about 30 years. And I suppose I've come at this completely opposite angle to yourself. So my interest and, and what has actually become a dirty hobby in, in Moulage started... Um, actually back in probably early 2000s sat in a rock pool in north devon mm-hmm. with a casualty that uh, we were going to try the local lifeboat crew with and um i looked at him and, and i'd drawn on his forehead with with marker pen and i thought how unfair it was that the, the people that were going to come and try and treat this would think well what have we got here you know catastrophic marker pen injury mm-hmm. um and just didn't didn't mean anything and and that started the, the sort of cogs turning and then I thought well, I, you know I'd like to actually do this and then I thought I can't do it because I don't have an artistic bone in my body and I started to do it and found that you you could do it even if you're not artistic mm-hmm. and so from a clinical point of view from approaching this as a clinician rather than approaching this as a makeup artist who's then going to help clinicians it was a case of um, have I got enough artistic in me that I can actually um, produce wounds that are passable mm-hmm. and then the whole thing sort of snowballed from there and now it's become the the garage taking over dirty hobby that it is but it's it's coming at it from that different angle and i think if this helps people who are doing um makeup as a, as a professional career and maybe have gone to makeup school or university and, and done their courses um if this isn't covered as part of their syllabus then maybe coming at it from that different angle as a clinician coming into it as opposed to a makeup artist going into something medical mm. if there's you know any bits and, and words of wisdom that we can um pass across that helps and then then brilliant because mm. i think it's it really throws you in the deep end when you're asked maybe you've not been around a medical scenario or you're suddenly asked to do a scenario you get that commission that you've been waiting from from and so many so many exercises happen now um you know there's lots and lots of people uh, are, are realizing the benefit of pre-hospital simulation and in hospital simulation that the two words there being pre-hospital being anything that occurs outside of hospital and in hospital being anything that occurs inside hospital but you have everyone now sort of doing lifetime exercises, oftentimes with either hyper-realistic mannequins or live casualties. Mm-hmm. And you get that sort of, whether it be your standard three services, be it police, fire, or ambulance, whether it be into any of the voluntary organizations, whether it be any of the search and rescue organizations. But there's been this massive drive recently away from low-fidelity mannequins to either high-fidelity mannequins that you can't spot them apart from real human beings or to real human beings with wounds on them. Mm. Because if you're placed in a scenario as a responder where someone's meant to be bleeding and you go up and you're just faced with a mannequin with a bit of red paint on it or something, it doesn't give you the complexity of the situation and likewise doesn't give you the emotion. Whereas if you arrive on scene to a really awesome actor who is screaming as well as having the wound and then starts to get into your head with, you know, don't let me die, I have children and really starts to get into your head the way that a real human being at their point of crisis gets into your head, Mm. that suddenly the stakes are up. This isn't just someone with a wound. This is someone with a wound, with a family, with children, with dependents. And that's the sort of stuff that clinicians have to put up with day in, day out. 
and try and have a filter to, to take out that filter, um, to try and be, you know, so focused on, on the initial life-saving interventions, especially if it's pre hospitally And so without that realism, it, if you come at it from a pure either beauty point of view or come at it from anything, you tend to, oftentimes you see, if you observe these things, either an over-egging, we've discussed already, and we'll, we'll talk more of the detail, but, you know, an over-blooding, and that analogy that made us both laugh that, you know, if you're throwing a nativity, then you do want a donkey. You don't want a unicorn with a rainbow mane because that's not what the nativity should feature. It should feature a scabby old donkey. And just don't give them the unicorn with the mane because you can or you think you should. Or unless they ask for it. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I then think check, it's true. But check the person asking knows what they're asking for. Yeah. Otherwise, the person asking might think they need the unicorn. Yeah. When actually the realism is the scabby donkey. I mean, I, I've been guilty of it myself where I will think of the drama of something and making it look like the biggest bang for the buck. And I'll be focusing on my edges and trying to make it look like it's really part of the skin. And that, because I don't have a clinical background, that will be my focus. So that part of it will be done competently, but it might be the wrong injury in the wrong place yep. because I'm not clinically trained. And it's interesting, like we were, we, we were bemoaning, for example, and I'm sure everyone's done it when they started, but you've got to be aware of it, is this big fucking red perimeter of shit around a wound in an attempt to hide your crappy edges because you don't typically get that. Those kinds of things actually say, look, I don't know how to do this, rather than, oh, there's no edge. You know what I mean? Which is yeah. in the attempt, isn't it? I, don't th um, I think that's, you know, we, we can sort of break down. You're so right. You, you arrive on scene and someone's got a big wax proboscis on their head with this big sort of target of red and blue and black around it, mm. which just isn't real. It doesn't look real. And it's not It's not for one of trying. But I think you can you can split medical simulation i suppose down into into four areas really it's it's who are you doing it for and why what's the what's the purpose of the exercise that you've been brought in to provide the makeup for mm -hmm. all based around correct wound etc you then got to have a whole world of thought oftentimes as the makeup artist you're responsible for the actor that you're putting it on and we'll come to that and then the final bit of setting the scene much like you said a film so for the, for the sake of helping people through their journey, maybe those four sections are the ones to, to sort of focus in and delve okay. in. Um, but I think if we, if we start off with purpose, you know, it's it's getting that, like you'd get a makeup brief. I don't know if you were going to go and do um, screen makeup or stage makeup, you'll get a brief. Same thing, you want a, a decent brief of what the purpose of that exercise is all about. Um, who are you doing it for? And what is the, the end purpose? So... Is it that they need hyper-realism in the wounds because you're actually going to have people diagnosing those wounds? Mm -hmm. Or is it they just need a mass of wounds in the right places because actually the intervention is quite quick? And sometimes it breaks your heart because you can you can turn out flat mold, for example, and apply it and blend it and put the right amount of blood on it and it looks awesome. And it might have taken you 30, 40 minutes to get that pace and maybe you know part of the day before making all the pieces. And then the medical intervention's less than a minute. Because someone's screamed up and gone, oh, yeah, that's that wound. Slapped mm -hmm. a dressing on it and moved on to the next patient. And mm -hmm. you're like, that took me ages. But, you know, it is what it is. And I think it's, if you actually get that result, then you've produced the right level of realism. Because the right intervention, the right clinical intervention has occurred. So I think it's, it's check with the team you're doing it with. What's the purpose? Who are the responders? What level are those responders? What are they going to be doing? What interventions are you expecting them to do the patient? And what is the purpose of the exercise? Because you can spend a lot of time creating perfect wounds and by that i mean visually photography film perfect wounds that aren't needed or the flip side is you just stick on a bit of wax and it is very much not good enough and mm -hmm. i think there's that middle ground that we can come to when we look at this sort of wound thing but sniff out that purpose first of all mm -hmm. find out who what when why how and, and take that detailed brief don't just take the oh yeah i'll come along and rock up and do some makeup for you yeah um find out why what are they trying to achieve and, and where and when mm -hmm. um and numbers and planning so a lot of these exercises might have 10 20 30 40 patients and you need to find out are you doing it on your own are there some that you know because again sometimes organizations will bring an artist in and say well you do 10 and another artist does 10 and then you find that you're turning up with flat molds and someone else is turning up with half a boiled egg they're going to literally sell a tape on somebody and call it a bruise and 
then the whole exercise gets skewed because it's not a, a level performance across the piece. Mm. So I think that whole detailed brief, how many am I responsible for? And then look at timings. You might have to stage people, bring them in, do your most complicated first, get those pieces glued on, get them stabilized, bring in simple ones to fill the gaps. But it's all about timetable. So there's a lot of work, I think, to be done pre-exercise. There is, and knowing your abilities and the, your team's abilities, you can carve out that time because I think a lot of people perhaps don't realize i mean if they've done it before they might know or they had someone who was shoddy do it quickly before you might go well it takes 40 minutes to do that and you go well yeah this is a really complicated thing so it's it's standing that ground isn't it and making sure that they've got 40 minutes you know have they got access to that room only 10 minutes before the scenario it's like well we can't get in until nine and it's like shit you know so the helicopter has to leave at three so we've got to get everything done by x amount of time and also segueing back to one of your previous podcasts know your worth because if they have had someone shoddy who's used joke shop materials and a bit of latex and a bit of tissue paper and walked away and maybe said bung us 25 quid i'll do your exercise for you when you are dealing especially with the big three police fire and ambulance budgets are incredibly tight there's not a lot of money for for high-end stuff and you cost me 50 quid mm. um and they might bulk at that let alone your time and, and effort so i think it's it's setting that realistic piece as well from that i love that you know your your analogy of what does it cost you to stand still mm-hmm. and work out a realistic price because there'll always be someone who'll go in less and oftentimes i'll take the less and then they realize why it's less and yeah. i think that's the same across any bit of makeup well, that you do but there's a uh, there's a, a a writer called seth godin um, they may have mentioned him before and he has a, a very good quote where he says uh, the danger with being the race to the bottom is you might win or worse come second it's just like you don't want to be the guy that's that's doing this for no money because the work is still yeah. got to be done and you'll I'll just pay. have a shit time doing it. So. I'll pay you to come and do your exercise. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that I think there's a there's a large piece to to do to talk to people to work out exactly what um, they need before you even get there. And then as part of the planning stage, I suppose when you think about the actual wounds, um, so many wounds that are portrayed aren't real. Um, and you'd be amazed, even some of the stuff on the high-end television. I'm, I'm the worst. I uh, I got very grumpy on the sofa the other night. It doesn't matter which program, but there's a program on mainstream BBC that specialises in a lot of dead bodies. Mm-hmm. Witless Silence, I think it's called. And um, it was, you know, it was absolutely stunning that one episode had awesome makeup, and the next episode, it looked like somebody had taken a bit of sculpture and just whacked on somebody's throat, had no edges, drew a line in it with a biro, and put some duff blood in it. And you're thinking, wow, this is a really important TV show. And that's a really important wound in the important TV show. And it just looked horrendous. Mm. And it, it's that sort of... We, we're so used to the portrayal of wounds on the television for effect. And, and it's what we were discussing earlier before we, we started recording. Is it, is, it, is it the fact that we've been sort of indoctrinated with the blood sprays and the kill bills and the you know the the sort of game of thrones throat slits and and everything that that portrays massive amounts of spraying blood is that what's driven video games or video games driven the desire to have that now on tv and Mm -hmm. and the portrayal of you know huge blood sprays that just don't oftentimes happen in real life that's a real bugbear of yours isn't it (laughs) It it and, and mainly because you can really trip the clinician on the way yeah so i might we might as well cover bleeding whilst we're here because we're sort of here but you know, we were describing that and how we teach students is, is you know, you are a, you are an enclosed system, you're a system of plumbing. And if you want that sort of analogy of a plumbing system or a home plumbing system, and, you know, you've got a cupboard somewhere with a boiler in it and some pipe work and a pump, mm-hmm. and it's all enclosed. And, and if you stand on your landing and you, and you stick a, you know, you stick a, a spear through the door of this cupboard and it goes into next week's towels, well, you haven't got a plumbing disaster. You've just got a hole in the door. Mm-hmm. And in medicine terms, that's a you know piece of destroyed soft tissue that might bleed a little bit, but you've not hit a major pipe. So you haven't got the spray that you're expecting. Um, yeah, if you go through the door of that cupboard and you hit a major pipe in there and it sprays everywhere, well, you've got a plumbing disaster. But the pipes in your body are quite small. They're quite well hidden. Uh, most of them are quite deep inside. And so the majority of wounds that people get are soft tissue wounds, which will drip as opposed to spray, squirt, or waterfall. Mm-hmm. because you've not hit a piece of plumbing and yet so many everything that's shown on television is fountains is spraying. And, and i think that comes down to it's a bit like you know um sometimes in the past i've, I've interviewed students for university for, for paramedic studies and 
they're expecting their career to be an episode of Casualty. Yeah. You know, every day is going to be a train crash followed by a plane crash followed by someone shooting everyone up in A&E. Yeah. And yet the average guy wearing a green uniform as a paramedic in the UK will treat one major trauma job a year on average and a couple of resuscitations a year on average. So most of their jobs are illness? Most of their jobs are, are multi-pathology geriatric patients, medical illness, mental health, drugs, drink, and they just run shift after shift after shift. And, and you see some of the students, you know, very early days in their career, significantly disheartened because they're not road traffic accident to road traffic accident to road traffic accident. Um, and don't quote me on the stat, but to give you a concept, it's roughly right. Um, you know, if you, London Ambulance Service look after inside the M25. Mm-hmm. And inside the M25, there are roughly 12 salvageable resuscitations taken a day out of their 10,000-ish jobs they might turn over a day. Mm. So you think actually the, the high-end medicine that you see on television of people jumping up and down on people's chests and attempting a, a meaningful resuscitation might occur 10 to 12 times a day inside the M25 with a population of millions. Now imagine the number of people in green uniforms running around there doing the other work. What are the other 10,000 jobs? Mm. If only 12 are jump up and down on the chest. And it gives you that concept of how much is medical work, psychiatric work, etc., and how often you don't come across this stuff. And then when you do come across this stuff, and, and it's like, oh, okay, my patient has a partially amputated foot. But there's no massive blood puddle around it. It's a partially amputated foot with a couple of drips around it on the lino. And you're like, yeah. oh, okay. And there's always some smart ass saying, oh, actually, I think you'll find there's a lot more blood there than whatever. Because yes. <laughs> they want to see it. Yeah. It's the spectacle of it. And, and we've been encouraged by directors and stuff to make these things visually obvious on, on, on a, perhaps a very kinetic scene. And the trouble is to take that into the real world. Yeah. Where you're training people medically is not the right and thing we're to all, do. And we're all drip fed, you know. We all, you know, we all have have come up on on sort of that sort of drip fed that gets into us when we're watching television. And such like, and television doesn't portray anything accurate. It doesn't portray resuscitation accurately. It doesn't portray woundings accurately. And I mean, in the old days, I don't, I don't watch anymore. But thinking now in the in the sort of 80s and 90s when I used to be watching Casualty, and you'd spot the person who's going to die in the first 30 seconds of the of the, it's like okay, something's mm-hmm. awful going to happen to him. But it was never. He killed over because he felt peaky. You know, he got hit by a train or a bus or fell out of a window. And it's all because that's what makes good television. You know, the mm. red stuff spraying everywhere makes good television. But it's just not accurate. And so if you take that sort of mindset and you turn up to try and produce a proper, accurate medical scenario for any level of medical responder coming in to treat it, you're just setting them up to fail. And that's the unfair bit. You're being set up to fail and you're setting them up to fail during their exercise. Mm. Um, because there are different things at different times in medicine they'll have to decide whether something is what's called a catastrophic hemorrhage or not. And if it's a catastrophic hemorrhage, they will do certain things. And if it's not a catastrophic hemorrhage, they won't. And so if you put a wound on the floor and then put, you know, buckets of blood around it, the clinicians go, oh, that's obviously a catastrophic hemorrhage. And that might throw them off if actually the brief was that it wasn't. Um, and so over-blooding and not portraying it correctly is, is mm. so done badly on television. And if people carry that mentality into a medical scenario style of moulage, mm-hmm. then you're setting yourself up and them up to fail. Talk a little bit about, because um, it, it surprised me, you were saying about like um, traumatic amputation and how it doesn't necessarily gush in the way you think it would. Yeah. So and why that is. So when you, you get um, an amputation of a limb, um, it depends how it's amputated. So something that's dragged, if the blood vessel is dragged apart, then it can start to bleed straight away. But if the blood vessel is cut neatly, sort of guillotine sliced, then you tend to get something. Um, the walls of an artery, which is the main outer feed under high pressure, have muscle in it, and it's designed to spasm. So when you neatly cut an artery, they shrink and they spasm. And that arterial spasm can last anything up to tens of minutes. So you can have someone have a limb chopped off, and the soft tissue, the muscle and the skin, will leak a little bit, the same as if you cut yourself in, in the kitchen. You get you know drips of blood. But you won't get the sort of Monty Python Black Knight squirt that you're necessarily expecting. Because mm-hmm. a nice clean um, wound, you'll oftentimes get arterial spasm. And that can hang in there for a long period of time. As I say, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Allowing you to arrive on scene and treat that properly and pack it and dress it. Um, and therefore you, you, you see people you know, with these comedy stumps just instantly spraying blood. And okay, fine. If that is the brief that this occurred 20 minutes ago, arterial spasm has been lost and your patient is now hosing, which will happen eventually. And you're expecting your responder to then turn up and apply a tourniquet, for example, to a limb and and correct in that fashion. 
then that's correct. That's that's the correct brief. But that's why it comes back to that importance of the brief. The person running the scenario, you know, do you want this to be an amputation that's happened in front of them? Therefore, it won't be bleeding a lot. Or do you want it in 20 minutes time? And then it might be bleeding a lot. And that's when you can run your blood pumps and your blood lines and, and such like. Um, and likewise, if we're, if we're talking bleeding, just bear in mind, if you're thinking of tissue colorations around a wound, bruising is blood that can't get out. So when you, you bruise, it's the tissue underneath has bled and that bruising can track to funny places. So, you know, you can, you can sprain your ankle and rip a ligament underneath the skin at your ankle and then have the bottom of your foot be black the next day because you've stood up and the blood has drained inside the tissue and then gather at the bottom of your foot. But if you actually have a, a wound associated with that direct trauma, you won't get as much bruising and that stops that big red thing which mm -hmm. is why you actually when you look at real medical wounds you might have a nice slice and that slice then might expose deeper tissue and you'll be bleeding from that slice but mm -hmm. you don't end up with that big target of red and black around it which when you do in moulage world just says hello i've got a sticky piece here or look at this photo you know it, it actually like a target focuses you in and makes the thing false um obviously you can get bruising in different places it doesn't mean if you have a cut on your chest and a bang on your head you won't get a bruise on your head of course but if the, bru if the cut and the wound is directly associated with the damaged tissue, you won't get that extensive bruising that you're expecting. Mm -hmm. um, so mine that sort of big blacky, reddy, bluey mess that you see a lot of people put around the piece in the middle, just producing a very false target that says, hello, I'm here, and this is false. Mm -hmm. And actually, a lot of times, medical responders can mistake that for burns because they know a wound doesn't look like that. They've seen wounds. So when they rock up and see something that looks like a bluey black target, they're like, oh, is that a burn then? What's my patient meant to have? Are they meant to have a burn or are they meant to have a bleed? It's that sort of thing. It's curious, isn't it? It's almost like you're better just to leave the, the, the worse edge because that's clearly the edge of the piece rather than, like you say, if you make it that sort of darker color, it could be mistaken for a different thing. And yeah. if you've got a guy there with a clipboard saying, no, 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 it's, it's, it's supposed to be this, <laughs> you've got to like actively forget what your brain's trying to tell you from a medical point of view. So. Yeah, so it's it's that it's again you don't want to set yourself up to fail, mm. especially if you want repeat work, and you don't want the medical professionals to start arguing at the point of feedback when you know the thing was meant to have a dressing and it got cooled in cling film because they thought it was a burn, and then the guy who's been you know, especially if some of these are for exams or for things like that, and the guy who's been a crane going sorry you know you failed because you put water and cling film on a cut well, it didn't look like a cut it looked like a burn, and that's that's not good for anyone. You know, that's, that's not where you want anything to be. So I think, you know, number one, let's not over blood things. Number two, let's make those, those skin tones accurate for what's gone on. And number three is, is really with that, this when we're talking specifically about the wound is to think about, is it in the right place? Um, I was at an exercise a little while back and the person was meant to have a chest wound. So all their symptoms were based around a penetrating wound into their chest that was going to affect their lung but the stab wound was on the stomach. And that's excusable because the person who applied the wound didn't know where the lung stopped and the stomach started, for example. And I think if you're going to get into this work, just have a quick look at, at surface anatomy, not at a crazy level, but understand where your lungs stop. Because, for example, lungs are the classic ones. People put their hands right on the bottom of their rib cage, assuming that their lungs go all the way to the bottom of their rib cage, and they don't. You know, On the average chap at the front, your lungs stop around your nipple level, go slightly further down at the back, but south of your nipples, on the right is your liver, coming to the midline, on the left is your spleen. Between them is your stomach, and then behind those two is your kidney, slightly further down your pancreas. And it, it's understanding that everything crucial to live is in your rib cage, and what's not in your rib cage is just intestine. So if you put, you know, if you put uh, a wound uh, anywhere outside of the rib margin, you're just in guts. Um, but if you put it on low rib margin, you could be at the back, you could be kidney territory, at the front, your liver and spleen territory. Mm -hmm. And again, a responder is not going to look at that wound in the right location. Let's say it's a chap and you've gone three inches south of a nipple. Then that's not going to get the medical treatment for a penetrating wound of the chest, which would be a chest seal, for example. It's going to get a dressing because they're going to go, mm, that's a liver that's bleeding. I put a dressing on it, apply loads of pressure and think about what's going to happen if a liver's bleeding inside, for example. So you're not going to get the, the respiratory symptoms you'd expect. with lungs. So suddenly you've got a guy acting a lung injury and the medical responders looking at a liver injury and they're both tripping each other up mm -hmm. because then you've got someone especially if it's an exam thinking wow is this some funky condition i really don't know about 
where you stab a liver and suddenly their breathing goes really, really weird, like they've got a hole in their chest. No, it's just because the wound's been put in the wrong place. So I, 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 it's, again, you, you trip each other up. Yeah. And some of this does come down to performance. Some of it comes down to exams. Some of it comes down to, to learning patterns. And, you know, you want these people to receive the best learning they can because you could be the next person in the car they come to look after. Um, and I, that's I, I'm passionate about that because it, it is real. You know, it's train hard, fight easy. And with a lot, of, especially when we do this maybe with, with the paramedic students who are learning or with any of the sort of volunteer sectors that are learning, if you can show them a wound that looks so real that the next time they see it for real, it doesn't phase them because the last one looked so real, then they're oftentimes at a stage of going, oh, I've done that before, I've seen that before. And therefore the whole panic of, oh my goodness, you know, this is the first time I've seen a massive laceration or a shotgun wound to the chest or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, if you make your simulation so real that they feel they've been there before, then you can take that initial impact out. Um, so please, please make sure that your wounds are in the right places. And understand, it, it, it doesn't have to be a great depth. You know, you, you can get lovely little images online just showing roughly what's underneath the skin as far as organs are concerned. And with landmarks like nipples and belly buttons and, and various joints, and you go, oh, right, okay. And things like, then a, a very, very simple diagram of the way circulation is. So if you're going to have a vessel that's cut, make sure your wounds are in the right place to caught that vessel, not miles away from where that major piece of plumbing is. Otherwise, people, especially if you start to end up with, you know, training... Um, doctors or surgeons who are coming out to the pre-hospital environment who you know operate on people and know exactly where this stuff is and then you put a crazy spurting wound somewhere where there wouldn't be a crazy spurting wound you can oftentimes see them just sort of think oh this is a bit daft and you can see their shoulders go down and and almost disengage because they know it's not real now Mm -hmm. whereas if you produce the right wound in the right place it takes nothing to to quickly look at anatomy and work out where the major plumbing flows put your wound over that major plumbing and then it makes sense. And if it makes sense in that medical responder's brain, up goes the ante. Um, and they can really then start, to, oh my goodness me, yeah, yeah, this is, the, what, what's right? and you can be amazed, you can take senior clinicians and lose them in moulage if it's accurate enough. Really, really lose them. Um, because you can just mimic that level of realism. But put the wound in the wrong place with silly patterning around it, mm-hmm. spraying too much blood. Mm-hmm. And it just screams instantly false. Yeah. And then you lose that whole effect of raising their adrenaline level and, and immersing them in the world of simulation because you just made it not. You might as well have someone dressed like the it clown yeah. with a balloon. It's just having a word. Like having Joe Pasquale do Hamlet or something. It's just like it just <laughs> fucks everything up. It's just you can't. You can't. <laughs> I'm now seeing this just, you know, the, the it clown with a little wound on his arm. Go, oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh. And then really, is the last little thing to talk about when we're talking specifically about the actual wound you create is you have to use the right materials. Mm. And I understand people are on different budgets. Um, I get that. But, you know, if you use wax, for example, you can create and carve the most beautiful wound, but it just doesn't survive first contact with the enemy. Um, and it's brilliant, I suppose, if you want to do a photographic piece for a manual or a piece of television where no one's going to touch it. Mm. But if you have someone who comes along you know, think of a very big, fit, strong firefighter who then takes a massive dressing and goes on top of your... This is uh, it, yeah. You may have to have three or four people being assessed on this wound and yeah. they're each going to go in there, manhandle and Direct pressure is something exactly. you have to do to treat yeah. a wound. So it, it also depends as well, because again, if you're doing a one-off exercise where the patient's going to be checked by three different people, so if you're doing major incident and you've got the guy who rocks up and finds you in the debris, for example, does a quick dressing drags you out to the casualty clearing station where you'll be seen by another clinician who might have to lift that dressing and look. And again, I was at a different exercise and, and you know, the, the, we had a patient arriving at the casualty clearing station and the guy went, yeah, he's got this massive laceration, you need to see it. Lifted the dressing and the senior doc was going, what laceration? There's just a red stain on his tummy. There's no wound there at all. And the actual wound was in the dressing because the, the wax had stuck to the dressing and, and it actually was a beautiful wound before the dressing went on. Mm. But there was no concept of that pre-brief What's going to happen to this wound? Where's it going to go? So sometimes you'll, you'll especially exam work, you might uh, put a piece on and the same situation has to be used three or four times identically for four different candidates at four different occasions. So you make it up, they come in, they treat, dressings have to come off and the thing has to be re, you know, made again to look perfect. And that's, mm. again, choose your materials well. So I find... You know, if you use a flat mold and you stay away from cream base and you use alcohol palettes to color it, 
and the only liquidy thing or, or removable thing you're using is the blood effect, then the blood's often soaked up by the dressing. But at the end, you can give it a quick wipe off or your alcohol colouring's still there and all you have to do is redress it with the blood and walk away. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if you'd, if you'd put your piece on and use loads of cream makeups, then they might be spread and wiped off and suddenly you realise that you've got a big job in between these scenarios when you might have three or four yeah. scenarios running simultaneously that you've got to dip in between. Yeah. And it's very nice to have four beautiful set pieces and then just go in, wipe them clean, blood them up, walk away. Yeah. And you know all the colouring and bruising and everything that should be there. Yeah. It's still there because it's not wiped away with the alcohol paint. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you may have your, your kit and you turn up with your, your nice Mac palettes and all that kind of stuff and your shimmery evening <laughs> eyeshadows and it's like, no. You need something that's going to be A, skin-like, but also, like you say, it's got to be durable, manhandled yeah. and abused and, and wrapped several times and treated and rinsed. And I'm now seeing Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Sat there with <laughs> Unless, you know, it's a Unless bomb it goes off in, in a nightclub. In a, and it's, in a know, drag club, yeah. yeah I yeah. think, I mean, so... Use the right materials as far as your skin colorings. Use the right materials as far as your wound. You know, latex doesn't tend to survive contact with the enemy. Tissue paper definitely doesn't. Wax definitely doesn't. Um, gelatin seems okay, but then a lot of people, especially if you're, you've got a lot of blood effects going, it can loosen quite badly and lift. Yeah, it can stain as well with the blood. Yeah. So I'm finding, I mean, I, I haven't found anything better really than, than just encapsulated flat molds to with a decent adhesive. I, I tend to, and I'm no makeup guru and jump in and correct, but I tend to be using, you know, a, um, a silicon based adhesive if there's lots of blood pumps going, because I just tend to find they just don't come off. Whereas, you know, if it's not, if it's, if it's a token wound um, and we're not going to have massive amounts of sweating and such, I might use prosate, but I think it's, it's the mixture of the, one of the two, depending on how much liquid's going to be around yeah. um, and how much the patient's going to be moving and sweating and worrying and, and having to be exerted if they're being rescued from a scene where actually they have to make some effort themselves. And I have to put a lot of people in water. And I find that, you know, uh, wounds, uh, encapsulated flat moulds in water, the prosade will just lift straight away, whereas I have found, you know, the silicon-based adhesive sleases and such like just doesn't come off. Mm. Um, unfortunately, we haven't found it. Well, then again, blood effects come off in water. So meant to. It's just that you've got to quickly revisit your patient when they're landed. Yeah. But then again, when you land a real patient out of water who yeah. is bleeding... Actual siren going off. Actual we? siren. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so... When you when you land a real patient who's bleeding, you know it takes a while for the blood to start to appear anyway because it has all been washed away in the water. Mm. So you can sort of just play, oh, pause for one second, come in and just gently make it up and, and let it go. But if the the bulk of it's been done with stuff that won't wash off and won't wear off, um, but I think that's the main things when you're thinking wound in medical moulage, think right, less is more, always less is more. Go for the right skin tones. Don't put massive targets around them. Don't make people think that bleeding is burns. Make your skin tones accurate, make your bruising accurate, um, make the position of the wound accurate and appropriate, and um, just make sure that you use the right materials, whether it be alcohol palettes for your skin toning so it doesn't wipe off, and silicon, etc., for your wounds, so that you've got the durability there, um, and you've not got things falling off. It's just embarrassing, isn't it? If, you, if you're running something, and you've been, especially if you've been paid to be there, and people are looking at you with that sort of raised eyebrow, because everything's meant to be stuck on a patient's now in the bottom of the dressing, and and they, they just don't know what they're supposed to be treating. Mm-hmm. And then from an exercise perspective, if you're running that, and I'm often on the, on the scent, I, I tend to do a lot of work where I make people up and then run the exercise as well. But if I'm running the exercise up and haven't done the makeup and all the wounds start to fall apart, you see your whole exercise fall apart. And mm-hmm. they're not cheap to, to lay on. You know, you've got a lot of staff there and you might have taken over a premise at night or taken it. And you've just got a lot of people giving their time and, and gear. And I mean, on some of these big exercises, you can burn two, three, four hundred pounds worth of dressings. Of people using real dressings at real time on people so you want it to be as real as you can yeah you were mentioning that drop. i remember doing some casualty simulation stuff and i had some either quick clot or hem clot i can't remember what it was and they also had a dressing they called an israeli bandage yep which was i don't know if that had stuff in it or or what but can you talk a little bit about the the, the blood thing because obviously if you get a bleed in a femoral artery where there ain't nothing to tie off unless you've got a pair of forceps or something you need to pack it in there yeah, I've got your three major tools for proper bleeding as opposed to I've cut myself on a tin can at the sink bleeding. So your three major tools for bleeding are a decent trauma dressing, which is a high robust type dressing. And the two main kids on the block there is the Israeli, which is, is called the Israeli bandage or the ECB emergency care bandage. And that's sort of one that's favoured, for example, by the British military. That's now the standard British military first field dressing. 
Um, and then you have another one called the Olays, which is made by a different company. And for example, that's pretty much the first field dressing for the ambulance service in the UK. So it's like saying, do you want a BMW or an Audi? You know, pay your money, takes your choice. They both get you there and they're both a German car. So it's, you know, there, there's some, they, there's certain bits of a decent trauma dressing. And we're not talking bizarrely. The one thing you don't need is the old trauma dressing of the 60s and 70s right. that now features in all HSE first aid kits. And the little one you've got over there, if you open it up, it'll be ambulance dressing number two and ambulance dressing number three, which are never used on ambulances anymore for anything more than tiny little nicks and bents because they don't stop massive bleeding. They're, they're a very simple, not that great pad on a very simple, not that great bandage, which is fine if you've cut yourself at the sink, which is what the HSE first aid kit's all about, cutting yourself on the sink. It's not, you know, no one runs towards somebody's arms hanging off with an HSE little green box, and I'm sure I can sort it with three rusty safety pins and a triangular bandage because... It's not the deal. So you've got major trauma dressings. That's that's your ECB, your Israeli, or your Olays. Um, and then your next level up is, you know, you, you can take because we look at a sort of stepwise approach to hemorrhage, your next level up, if appropriate, for limb bleeding might be tourniquet. Tourniquets are very much in these days, um, and they're, they're not going to go out. They, you know, they've come in since 2005, and they've stayed in. Um, for our American friends, tourniquet. Oh, yes. But uh, yes, so... Um, they're pretty much there and, and most of the, the successful devices are based on a windless type system mm-hmm. and there's a variety of, of, of makes and manufacturers and again you pay your money takes choice but you're looking at a windless device which goes around a limb and tightens really hard and in doing so squeezes the soft tissue against the deep vessel primarily the artery and then stops blood supply mm-hmm. um, and again cutting those myths you know you put a tourniquet on a limb doesn't mean the patient's going to lose the limb below that tourniquet it's not the case and when it comes to tourniquets, of course, you can then do funky things in the moulage world. So if you want a piece that's aggressively bleeding, again, going back to that pre-brief and correct wound, if you if you want a piece that's aggressively bleeding, and that's what the scenario leads for, then have a lovely big flat mould. You know, run your bloodline, uh, like a nice soft silicon bloodline, under the piece and then bring it out into the wound. And then if a tourniquet is applied correctly to that limb... It should actually squeeze down very early before it even squeezes the limb. It should squeeze down on top of the flat mold, on top of the silicon piece, and actually will stop bleeding the way that bleeding should be stopped by a tourniquet. But it means you don't put your actor through the hell of a tight tourniquet because they are incredibly painful. So, again, hiding a bloodline under the piece, or if your piece isn't that big, you know, selective use of clothes to hide um, the bloodline. But we'll come to how that fails in a minute when you get all your clothes cut off you. But you might have a bloodline running under clothes, and again, you can you can actually cease the false bleeding by the correct application of a tourniquet, which is quite funky. Yeah. Um, and then the last one being hemostatic dressing. So that you're saying that there's quick clot, there's hemcon, there's cellox, um, and a variety of others. But they're basically um, clotting agents, either sort of shellfish based or clay based, inside a dressing that when you place on a bleeding vessel. For want of a better term, it's not cauterized because there's no heat involved these days, but they they cease bleeding. By a chemical reaction, they cease bleeding. And highly, highly effective on wounds that are massive, but you can't tourniquet due to location. So, for example, it's the it's it's like the, the Black Hawk Down groin wound, where they can't tourniquet. It's right in the crease of the groin, and they were trying to get that, that vessel, and they had it at one point in there in the fingers, and it mm-hmm. slipped up. It's that sort of stuff that's awesome with hemostats these days. Um you won't often find live hemostats used on exercise unless it's a very high-end exercise because they're still 20, 30 pound of dressing and you can really ramp your exercise cost up if you're using live hemostats. Um, but oftentimes they might be a normal simple gauze that's a pound of gauze just written as if it's a hemostat but it still needs to be used in the same way. And that's another thing that comes back to your wound robustness because hemostats need to be packed into a wound and then that pressure of packing maintained. And if your wound is, is wax, it's not going to survive first contact with a hemostat at all. Or likewise, if you glue, even if you've got a nice deep silicon piece, but your glue's not great, when someone actually applies uh, a hemostat into the wound and then applies the correct pressure on top of that hemostat, because it's not fairy dust, you can't just leave it there, you've got to apply a lot of pressure on top of the hemostat as well, and apply that pressure for at least a couple of minutes for it to work. And if you're not careful, the whole thing just gets drifted away. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, it's find out what is going on. Find out what these people want and what they need to cover at the beginning of their scenario with that really good brief. <laughs> And I think the last thing that I found out from you that blew my mind in a sad way is, uh, you know, I was I was hoping to be able to pick the brains of, of 
you know, a, a makeup guru like yourself and go, oh, how do I do that slit throat like Game of Thrones when I do want to create a wound in front of somebody like an attack and, and I don't want the blood spray, but I want to actually cut skin, blah, blah, blah. And then you tell me it's all done post-production. And it's like, no, it's not like my whole, my whole dream of, you know, the whole concept that the blade isn't even there and it's all put in digitally. Afterwards, sometimes, it? sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. I mean, a lot of it is the, the practicality of cutting that skin live. And yeah, there, yeah, there are, quite a few occasions where they put the blade in afterwards just because it's safer as well if it's a very sort of you know, kinetic and safety is crucial but yeah. it does mean that if you're desperate for that effect yeah at a at a, at a non-professional tv level it's almost impossible to create in and we're, we're looking at, at new techniques and and some people that uh, are looking at things like what's called no sharps training where they're trying to move away um, from anything sharp be it scalpel needle on an exercise scene and but if you, you and you can cut certain sort of surgical tapes, sleek and such like, with with plastic spatulas. What is but, the reason for that? Is it is it to make it safer so that more training can happen? Yeah. So so there's certain surgical techniques that you might do in a pre-hospital environment, either a surgical opening of the airway. So you know, because the big biro thing doesn't exist, you don't take out the contents of a big and hammer it in the front of someone's throat. That's not the way you you do it. Um, but actually creating a surgical incision across an airway for an airway that needs opening at the throat level rather than the mouth or or back of the the sort of airway level um or opening a chest there's something called a finger thoracostomy where they, they put a a, a scalpel wound inside of a chest and insert their finger into a chest to decompress pressure inside a chest now sometimes in in trauma scenarios especially it's lovely to try and recreate those but you've then got to cut the patient in the right place and you've got to produce a cut so it's either you have a whole bolt-on false piece with maybe Kevlar between the patient and the false piece, so when they do cut it, fine. But and we've we've trialled things, um, and and I've known people who've built sort of devices that have almost been like a lunchbox with sort of ribs dremeled out inside, and then it'll because they do bleed slightly, so a little balloon of blood and such like, and and that sort of mock up sim worked incredibly well, and for the actual technique. But the problem is you've then got a lunchbox bolted on the side of somebody, so you lose that concept. And then I know they were trying to take that a little bit further and try and model a false chest and build the lunchbox into the chest but then you've got a tiny actor with a massive chest and again mm. you lose that that sort of uh, ultimate realism and, and that's the difficult when you end up with that real I need to do this this complex surgical procedure it needs to be done well with the right anatomical landmarks because the person who's doing it will be counting down rib spaces and, and putting the incision the incision doesn't go anyway because in a very specific position mm. um and likewise, the, the throat one has to go in a very, very specific position because it has to go through a certain cartilage at the front of the throat. It's not just any old thing. It's, it's, it's open up this piece of tissue. Um, and it, it, has to, it has to go through between two cartilages across this membrane, and it has to be that membrane. And they'll feel it. So the anatomy is not right. It's not right. So it depends, again, where you're going with that level of realism. I guess the other element is you've got yourself, you're doing your makeup. And then you have your performer, and this may or may not be a professional actor. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not a professional actor, just a willing volunteer. Yep. Um, so, and that's the that's the next bit is because almost stepping that little bit away from the physical makeup is oftentimes the people who've asked you to do this are clinicians themselves running a course. So they might be, you know, they might be firefighters who have a, a, a tend towards medicine. They might be police officers who have a you know who are looking after the medicine for the police force. It might be the ambulance service, but. They're not going to be, you know, people who are used to setting up film sets and dealing with actors. So they'll put out a, a request for good willing volunteers. And so you have the great and the good rock up who are prepared to help you out. But again, they're going to arrive with not a lot of preconception of what's going on. And everyone brings their own issues to the party. And I think it's really, and as oftentimes, the, the person running the exercise, because they're not used to the film world, will assume that, ah, the makeup artist will just look after all the casualties. Done. And so you can end up with this by default. And it is quite crucial because of what's going to happen. And, and again, you can fall into these little pitfalls. And I trust you, I've fallen into all these pitfalls before. And is I'm not some great guru. I've just learned from the things that have gone badly wrong on days. And I think the first thing is, ideally pre-event, you know, the last thing you want is you're asked to do a big exercise. You're going to do a variety of wounds to, let's say, 15 patients. And the people who've asked you to do the exercise have given you the 15 wound patterns and you've made your flat molds and you've rocked up on day one and you don't know who's coming through the door. Um, and I've been in places assuming um, that 15 people are going to walk through the door and 15 people walk through the door of the complete opposite skin tone to all my pieces. And I've gone, oh, rats. 
none of this is going to work now. And I think it's, or you end up with real intensive sort of, you know, palette stippling to try and hide mm. your piece that's completely inappropriate for what you've been. So print, if you can get ideas of who's coming, it's such a help because one, you know, find out who they are, what they are. But most importantly, find out, start to allocate patients um, to their role or all, all, no, no, the way around, I suppose, allocate your volunteer to the patient role. Because what I mean by that, I've, I fell foul. I was, I was doing a big exercise. And I was chatting away to this, this lass and we gave her a really lovely open fracture of her leg. And she loved it. She was quite into the makeup and she was, you know, she was really cool about it. And then we said, right, we're ready for you. Yep, we're going to pop you out to the scene and then the guys are going to come. And the scene was a car, and the car was all you know smashed up, and it was a, a patient, a front seat driver with a with a nasty leg fracture, and she froze at the doorway and said, "I can't do it," and you know the thing's going to roll in three five minutes time, and I'd not pre briefed her about where she was and what was going to happen to her, and I went low to her and she said, "My parents died in the car crash. No way I'm getting in that wrecked car," and so she she had her own one hundred and one, she had her own issue that she came with. She didn't need to declare that issue. She was coming as a good willing volunteer. But suddenly we've stirred up a whole load of emotion that we didn't know was there. Mm. And you'd be amazed the number of people who have got either friends that have been affected by something or, um, you know, it's a dreadful one that, that catches you out sometimes. Um, quite a lot of scenarios I have to do might involve a hanging. Mm. And the number of people who are like, no, no, I can't be anywhere near that because either somebody I knew hung themselves or indirectly I knew or no, I'm not yeah, having anything to do with it. By, yeah. And it's that sort of, or, you know, you do a deliberate self-harm wound. And, you know, you do someone with sort of lots of slashes up the, their arm. And then I'm people are like, no, I can't do that because of something that's happened to me in life. So it's crucial to look after these people that come. You can't slap on makeup on the good looking because they're not paid. You know, none of these people in medical simulation are usually paid as actors. They are good looking, uh, good looking, good willing volunteers who end up not looking great because they end up looking mashed. Mm-hmm. But I think that, you know, they're they're giving their all. And it's crucial, crucial that they know what they're stepping into. So that pre-brief of right i need someone who's happy to have a massive burn on their face i need someone who's going to have and let themselves select then it's like right okay so mavis you are having the face burn is that cool yes it is right and then you brief them on the thing you're going to do to them and i think so first of all self let them self-select where you can but make sure that they know what's going on from that point of view um that way you're not stepping on their own sensitive sort of room 101 issues then sort of pre-brief them and explain to them where the wound is going. Because again, we all have, you know, there's bits of us we like and there's bits of us we don't like. Um, and in a lot of medicine, there's going to be quite a lot of nudity, which we'll come to in a minute, you know, because trauma medicine is usually a naked cut down. It's not an exercise, but they will cut clothes off. Because they've got to find where yep. the injuries are and you may be unconscious. And... Yep. And, and the standard UK approach for major trauma is a naked cut down. Right. Um, so they will cut your clothes off to naked to completely go through your whole body to find everything they need to find out. Um, and if you didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> yes, quite. It's, it's quite a, but, you, you, you know, now? <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, but I, I, I think, well, we're here. Let's, let's cover that one for a second. So, you know, um, it's important that the people who are coming know that they're going to have their clothes cut off them. Now, normally in, in exercise, you don't cut underwear off, so you don't go to nudity at all. But, Number one, you want people to understand they need to be in the right underwear. So if they're going to be in underwear, make it big and make it not see-through. Um, otherwise, you're lying there in something that's small and see-through, feeling incredibly vulnerable. So that pre-briefing of actually, you know, I'm going to put a wound on your abdomen. Is that okay? Yes, it is. You know, it's going to have a bit of gut hanging out. Is that okay? Yes, it is. Right, just so you know, the team are going to cut your clothes off and you will be there in your pants and bra, for example. Ah, well, no, that's not all right then. Okay, so right, we need to find you. What do you want? I have a wound on my head, thanks you know, where I might not get a full cut down, et cetera, et cetera. So it's making sure people are happy. And likewise, um, on that note, oftentimes I've told people happy to be seen in swimwear because it has a level of decency that doesn't upset anyone. So then one piece is because sometimes one piece swimsuit hides bits that you might want to stick bits on. Um, but a decent, big, chunky bikini mm. keeps people modest. It protects them from that point of view, which is quite crucial. Um, so yeah, explain to them this common practice. And I suppose that links straight in as well to make sure that you, you are, you, you know, the pre-brief for these things obviously is come in old clothes. And the number of people I've, I've had at the end of the day going, uh, I just came in old clothes and now my old clothes are cut into tiny, tiny ribbons. I need to go home and I'm stood here in, in a bikini. How do I get home on the bus? And then you start to rebuild their clothes with gaffer tape and you're like, you know, just <laughs> stitching it all together. Um, 
So it's it's always worth again make sure these people are coming understand you know bring a spare set of just that extra word spare you know, mm-hmm. bring a spare set of old clothes come in normal clothes arrive put your swimsuit on or put your bikini on put your swimming trunks on if it's a guy whatever get into the, your old clothes that are going to get cut off and a bit like getting changed at a swimming pool or a gym or whatever you know leave all your good stuff there then we'll make you look messy all that's going to get cut off to ribbons and then go away get cleaned up get changed put your proper underwear on put your proper clothes on go home. Um, and I think that's again so many people don't understand that they end up with everything or they come with a really nice top on you know when you start to do teenagers you take old clothes and some of the stuff you're cutting it's like really this is a hundred pound top oh, well I, I didn't want to look too bad in front of everyone but I'm going to have to shred this now oh no, it was okay and it's too then their modesty's cut in then and their their sort of sense of pride's cut in and they don't want to be seen to be the ones going hey I've got a fancy top on and this sort of stuff so that nice pre-brief um and likewise, the number of, and I'm sure you get this in normal makeup world, but the number of girls who will spend an eon arriving looking amazing with makeup. There you go, take it all off, please, because I'm going to stick a piece on your forehead and make you look like you're really poorly. Mm. And they've spent hours that morning making themselves look So amazing. it's just, from a makeup artist's point of view, it's just making sure that they're aware of what that is. Because you're right in that all of this should have been explained to them. But it might not have been. So it's just, <laughs> you should have your checklist in advance and go, just, you know. <laughs> yes. This is what's going to happen. Are you doing commando week? You didn't realize we we're going to be cutting your trousers off. Whatever. <laughs> <It's> like, <yeah. laughs> so I think, you know, make sure your patient knows what's going to happen to them in that scenario or your good willing volunteer. Make, you know, what patient role are they going to have? Um, make sure they, they have old clothes. If they're cut apart, it doesn't leave them compromised. Make sure their underwear is, is, is not compromised. Um, and then also the last bit, and we were just getting to that when we started talking about nudity, is just make sure that the bit that they're going to have injured, they're happy with. So they might, you know, they might feel self-conscious, you know, sat up. They might have a couple of rolls of fat in their tummy they don't like. And it's just, no, I don't like that. And so if you then go and put an abdominal wound on them and ask them to sit there with the most bit of their body they, they like the least on show, again, it's just uncomfortable for them and they might even refuse so find out, you know, and that's oftentimes you sort of say, hey, I'm planning to put a big piece on your leg. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm quite happy to get my legs out. You know, don't put something on my tummy. Don't put something on my head. And, and likewise, they might have either had procedures or I was doing a, a headpiece on somebody the other day who'd spent a fortune on having her eyebrows done. Mm-hmm. And the headpiece would have trashed that and it would have trashed her eyebrow makeup and, and everything she'd spent a lot of money on. So, of course, she didn't want it done there. And she's not getting paid to be here. She's just being here to, to be a good willing volunteer. So I think just bear that in mind when you're doing those type of people as well, just making sure that you're not ruining things they've come with. And they're giving their time. They're giving their goodwill. Mm. We never thought to mention, have you just had microblading yesterday? You know, yeah. we're going to have to uh, remove all that. And then I think, um, it, and then like any medical procedure, you know, gain consent from them. Explain what's going to happen to them. And part of the almost you go through gates of them saying no thanks it might be no thanks i don't want this no thanks i don't want that no you know don't put me in the car or don't put me in the ditch i don't want a wound on here or the, you know almost through gates and then the last gate is explaining what's going to be done to them medically because they might say oh no i don't want that you know i don't want them to to put a dummy drip in my arm i don't want them to you know i can't stand needles so if they're going to actually get anything out that's got a needle i'm just going to feel poorly myself and, and no thank you so if you explain the medical procedure that's going to go on to them as well and make sure they're happy with that um we've had some instance in the past where i mean the methodology is, is getting less and less these days but you know where you've put collars on people and put them on spine boards and head shocks and all that stuff's going thank goodness but that's another medical conversation but i think you know some people actually felt claustrophobic so you know pinned in a collar with their heads in such like they just didn't like it they didn't want to do it and you can have the scenario can be running beautifully and then you get to that point and the patient's like, I'm not playing anymore. And then your scenario crashes in front of you because you have to look after them. But they didn't know what they were letting themselves in for. Mm. And it's, it's as clinicians, you just run up and you start doing stuff to people and, and you touch people. And, and, you know, even the concept of them, oh, what do you mean they're going to handle me? Yeah, they're going to handle you. They're going to search you. They're going to touch you. Oh, I'm not sure about that. So it's that, it's that whole thing. As clinicians, you just run up and grab people. You're very touchy mm-hmm. people. Um, and people who aren't in that world necessarily aren't used to that with the classic sort of British at least one meter exclusion zone around each other. Yeah, quite. But like you say, if someone's passed out and, and bleeding or injured, it's like I, I have to find where that wound is, otherwise you might die. So you know, I'm motivated to, to check and <laughs> dig around. And yes, it may not be obvious where it is. You know, yeah. so and whilst you, there's professional and proper ways of doing that, yeah, 
even the fact that you might cut their clothes off and start touching them as a volunteer actor they might be like oh I'm not sure. no mm. not into that don't that's not what I want um and I think also then it's crucial that somebody and it might not be your job as the makeup artist but somebody then has to brief them on the symptoms they're going to display um and it might fall to you to just to say from the you know from the the, the sort of directing staff they've said could you please be breathless and unable to speak and drifting in and out of consciousness? They might give you a brief to actually read to your patient because they might be too busy to do it. it depends on the size of exercise. Um, and I know I end up sort of, because I'm coming at it from a clinical angle, I'll, I'll do the makeup and then brief the patient at the same time and say, this is how it's going to feel. Because nothing worse. I've done it before because a lot of volunteers tend to be teenagers. Um, uh, they either tend to be teenagers or the elderly because the elderly have got time and the teenagers often have come in from colleges and schools to learn and that's brilliant but then they get really excited by the whole thing because there's blue lights and there's uniforms and people running around and it's quite cool and then you've got someone with the most horrendous injury sat there giggling and it's like no 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 you wouldn't giggle with those injuries and again it, it's it can lead clinicians down the wrong path if they think you're doing something a bit altered you know if you're sat there with half your leg missing or your guts in your hands laughing are you laughing because you're on something? Is that why you've got your gut? You know, because it, it, they'll come with that sort of diagnostic mind. Mm-hmm. You know, why are you doing that? And actually laughing because either you feel embarrassed or you think, you know, it, it's a it natural human reaction, is it, to laugh at some things or giggle because you're getting excited about it. But it's actually not part of the scenario. And they've not been told to do it. And suddenly you end up with things that look all a bit weird. So there's nothing worse than, you know, putting the whole thing together of having a wound that's squirting blood comedy style in the wrong place on the wrong body with a target around it with someone laughing. It's just, you lost everything. Mm-hmm. Reality's gone completely. And, and it is the difference. I've seen, I've, I've been on, on scenarios where there's been stunning actors, absolutely stunning actors who aren't necessarily professional. And I've seen them absolutely take experienced clinicians apart at the seams because they just get into their head. And they, you know, they're there, they might have a wound and they might be hysterically crying and they might be panicking. And then they start to put in that overlay of, you know, don't let me die, I've got kids. And and, and just things that start to get into the mind of the clinician mm-hmm. and up the ante. And, you know, I have seen to come out and just step away from a scene because they've been totally either dry. literally totally psychologically brought in by the mixture of right environment, right wound, right acting. So you have a mashed car with the patient sat next to their dead husband in the other front seat so you have like a hyper realistic mannequin that's very obviously dead the patient screaming entrapped next to the dead corpse of their partner with the clinician trying to somehow gain access to this vehicle and then control the patient who's then going on about anything else but the wound going on about the life with the husband or you know God, how can i go on how can he you know all the stuff that happens in human emotion at the, at the impact of of your world's colliding and you, if you can just get that magic mix of right scene, right wound, right actor, even if it's not a professional actor, you can get some really good willing volunteers. Just stunning. And you can see people who've been doing it for years taken in, completely immersed. And there is that sort of terminology, immersive simulation. And if you can produce something that is so close to realism, um, but you'll never achieve that with the wax proboscis, with the target around it, with five litres of blood on the ground with someone giggling and that's my I love it that's my when when, you, when it hums when it all comes together yeah and you see you know a brilliant clinician totally either immersed and lost and when you call time they're like oh, oh god yeah we were playing wow or you see an awesome clinician and not what you want to see this but dissolved by the scenario you know taken apart of the seams to the point where you almost have to take them away and, and help them back you know, bring right. back to uh, yeah, yeah. Then you've done it. You've taken some, and I suppose that's like an amazing piece of film, isn't it? If if someone either you know loses themselves in a film or loses themselves in a piece of music, yeah, the mechanism whatever, of it is not at all evident. It's, yeah, yeah, it's just seamless. Yeah, and that's 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 when you get it. Hmm. That's when you really hit the sweet spot. Yeah, that's cool. the day it's going well. Yeah, amazing. And then we get into the thorny subject of safe words. So I'm, I'm going to keep appropriate and I'll let you be inappropriate as your podcast. But safe words. Everyone should have a safe word um, and you should ideally have the same one. So your casualty has a safe word and your team knows that, your treatment team. So at any point in time, the casualty can call the safe word and everything has to stall. Um, 
because you know you can be doing things around people with sharp instruments or you can be putting them on a stretcher and pinching them or most commonly people get either too hot or too cold you know you've arrived on scene and you're not necessarily thinking as a clinician you've cut all the clothes off real time of the the casualty and they're lying on freezing cold tarmac and they start to shake and everyone's going that's really good acting look at that look at the way they're shaking look how pale they've gone that brilliant and you've got a pseudo hypothermic actor you know going ah because they've just lost it yeah and then they're sort of going for real and you know for real is a good buzzword because it normally doesn't cut into anything else you know if you've got a weird pineapple plantation scenario pineapple or armageddon or hamster doesn't always work so you know just just have your your for real i'm cold for real you're pinching me for real it hurts and if if the treatment team know that at any point in time anyone screams for real be it team or patient everything stops and it's literally like sleeping lions everyone just freezes and whoever's called it says for real don't stand up you're right above a very jaggedy point of metal that's going to stick in your head if you stand up or you know for real i'm freezing cold I don't want to play anymore. For real, you really hurt me. Whatever, but you know, get that safe word and make sure that's that's done. Um, and again, on actor prep, you know, just pre-warning for some of the gents on shaving um, <laughs> because they, they turn up with hairy chests and and even if you can put your wound in such a position that you're not giving them a free wax before they go home, you know, some of the treatment modalities will defib pads if they're applied. Even if obviously the defib won't be turned on, but defib pads applied or monitoring pads applied, um, chest seals. There's lots of big sticky things in medicine, and there's nothing worse than someone going, "Oh yeah, that's fine. Of course I'll get my chest out. I'm really ripped." And then you know they're like a big hairy bear, and you think, "Uh oh." And the number of times I've sent people home with big sort of bits as you're learning, big bits missing, and they've not been briefed. And and a lot of the guys won't want to shave their chest, for example. So maybe you find somebody else who isn't as hairy or somebody who hasn't got hair on their chest at all or whatever. Um, so you haven't got your hairiest guy because he's the only one who wanted to get his chest out because he's right. ripped. But he's ripped and hairy, not just ripped. And take, taking it off and cleaning it up, that's not a clinical job. It's like, I saved your life. If you're alive to go home, then you take the fucking things off. Yeah. <laughs> Which perhaps people are, are not aware of. <laughs> and Yeah, and so again, as, as the there's the sort of makeup-y type person on these things. They'll be coming back into you at the end of the exercise with their toes cut to ribbons with bits stuck on them and they'll look at you and go, what the? Yeah. You never told me about this. And you can get a bit of anxiety at the end of the day because there's people, you know, I'm supposed to be going out in three hours and sorry, you've used a blood on me that stains and now I look like a baboon's backside for the next three weeks. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing, I suppose, you know, just make sure you're not staining people. And, and even some of the professional stuff stains like fury. Um, skin and concrete and god knows what so going back to, to your blood podcast you know I've, I've used since I listened to it um, the, the coke trick yeah. coke with a bit of, of that's Stewie blood. Comran put me into that one to thin it down yeah and it's brilliant because it, it's just not staining whereas some of the professional companies even their sort of mass blood powder type stuff yeah. does the job but boy you know stains concrete stains human I, the number of times I've got to make who uh, I work with in the fire service doing scenarios. And the number of times I've sent him home with literally a baboon's backside because we do groin stab. <laughs> and the poor side is, is going away. And for weeks, he's sort of like orange from the waist down. Oh, my God, yeah. And it's just unfair. Got to do it right. Um, Rob Smith's blood. That's one I like best. Then I showed you the Rob Smith stuff, I think. It's quite, yeah. it's nice and opaque. Um, yeah, the that that um, a slight sideline. I used, uh, it was Stuart Conran that, that mentioned it and it was a tip he gave to somebody else and I've co-opted it but I, I credit him with it and he used flat Diet Coke to thin blood for pumping the reason being Diet Coke isn't sticky so it won't attract flies and wasps in summer um, but because it's dark when you thin it it doesn't make it more translucent as well so it's, it's really effective even if it's just like store brand cola but just make sure it's flat first because i don't really think fizzy blood is something you want happening i mean it will look spectacular but it's not it what you're me, supposed yeah. to do no we we used it great great effect back in the summer on a big fire exercise and it was flat diet coke with some ben nice stage blood just to cover it up a tiny bit but we used maybe you know in a liter of coke i don't know 10 15 mil of stage blood rather than a liter of stage blood and mm it just gave it that that right colouring whereas normally what you have is people water down blood products and you get pink don't you and, and pink's not what comes out of people um, so yeah which these are I suppose to our last um, topic because we've looked at the purpose for it we've looked at the, the type of wound and where in its location we've looked at all that sort of actor compliance and everything you need to do to look after those actors that might fall 
as your role because it's not a film set. But the last bit is about it potentially, you know, you're having to treat it a little bit like a film set. I suppose setting the scene for realistic motion art because there's nothing worse than, um, you know, you create a beautiful wound on somebody. Um, let's say they've they they're in I don't know they've fallen down a set of steps and they've got a, a head injury and you create a great head injury wound and then then you take them out to the scene and you sit them on the steps and they're neat their clothes are neat the steps are there and they they've got a cut head and it's sort of for a medical responder then nothing screams I've fallen down the stairs it screams oh okay someone sat on the bottom step with a cut head does that mean someone sliced them neatly with a knife and walked by have they you know, I don't know, were they doing DIY and have cut themselves? But it doesn't make sense. And, and please bear in mind that most medical responders are trained to interpret a scene. Because yeah. they arrive fresh, they're looking, is it yeah. safe? So they, they have stuff. scene interpretation and they go through a, a process of something called mechanism injury to look at the scene and try and become a bit of a detective and go, All right, what's happened? So if you want someone to have fallen down a set of stairs, you need to set that scene as if it's happened. So do you, for example, put the patient at the bottom of the stairs in a crumpled heap and therefore their clothes should look like they've come down the stairs so if it's inside fine they might be untucked they might have been pulled as they've come down the stairs if they've got specks on maybe they've lost their specks halfway down the stairs maybe there's one slipper halfway down the stairs you know if it's slippers that cause them like an elderly patient to fall from the top of the stairs but one slipper at the top one slipper halfway down then they've got an insinuation of where they started and the journey they've come down the stairs and if you've got a bleeding wound then just in a couple of places and remember not to over blood but a tiny smear here, a tiny smear there. Is there a smear on the banister? Is there this sort of stuff? Um, and they can then read the scene the way that a professional would read the scene and say, oh, hang on, maybe I've got a slipper on the top step. Mm -hmm. I've got a blood smear there, a dent in the banister there, and another slipper there and the glasses at the bottom. I know they've come from the top. Yeah. They've come down 16 stairs. Now I'm thinking, what happens to an elderly patient who's come down 16 stairs? See, that's, that's a very interesting point because if you were going to do that on a show, like a movie, you'd have someone whose job it was to look after the set. You'd have a costume person, you'd have a hair person, and all of those would want to contribute and they'd mention that and they'd involve it. Whereas if you're going to a scenario, if you're makeup and you're dealing with someone that's doing the medical training, they're not worked on a film set, like you said, they just assume, well, you deal with actors, so you'll know all of that. Yep. And it may not be occur to them to, to bring that up. So because on a film set, you would have other inputs. It's very important, like you say, to make sure that you're clear about what it is they are expecting. Again, going back to your first point, what is the purpose of it? Yeah. You what know? am I looking for? And what am I trying to create here? And, and never underestimate that, you know, all good clinicians will be mechanism injury. They'll be looking at it and going, right, okay. Um, and looking for for those hints on that scene as to what has happened because especially if your patient's unconscious you need to put that mental picture together to think you know what's happened I mean you know it's, as we were talking I work in search and rescue and and we have a lot of people jump off bridges and it depends on the state of the tide so as the boat is launching and I'm on it I'm thinking what's the tide doing because it can be the difference between 20 foot or 70 foot when we're looking at the river Thames as someone comes off a bridge they might come 20 foot into the water they might come 70 foot into the water that's going to have different injury patterns and different thought processes go through your head. And that's what clinicians do. So, again, don't let them down. If, if they're there to learn, that's what your your job is to help that learning. Don't let them down. Mm. Um, and don't let yourself down. And think about how am I going to set this scene. And, and you know, I've got a, a lovely polystyrene simulated brick. And, you know, so you can create the wound that a brick to a head does and then put a tiny bit of blood in the corner. Throw the brick to one side, but then suddenly someone can go, oh, here's a brick with blood on it and there's a brick-shaped hole in their head. Yeah. Right, someone's been hit with a brick. It's either fallen off a building site or someone's used it as a weapon. It could be a serious, And now if it's an yeah. assault, oh, hang on a minute, the first thing that clinicians will go, personal safety, who assaulted them? They're still here, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. you can add elements to your scenarios by that sort of stuff. And, and it might be that the treatment, you know, the, the people who are assessing that work are, are looking for the guy to go, oh, actually, this is a, a violent episode. I'm not safe. I'm withdrawing until I'm safe. I'm withdrawing until... I've got police on scene or whatever. That might be a crucial part of the scenario. Yeah, because they're bleeding out. But if you think there's a somebody there who would harm you, then you yep. So it might be in. a drag rescue. It might be a case of they're bleeding out. I know safety's over there. I will just drag them, control their bleeding while I finish the drag to save them. Yes. So I'm making myself themselves safe because oftentimes in medicine, rescue is the first part of medicine. And the more austere environments or the more search and rescue you go, or or whether you then go into sort of the terrorist incident or the, what they call the hot zone. Oftentimes, rescue is the first part of the medicine, and then you get to a position of safety where you can affect effective medicine. So it's that sort of, right, okay, what am I going to do? And 
that's why it's so crucial to get the brief. It's not just an actor sat there with a mm. you know dent in the head. What do the treatment team want to get out of it? What do the assessors want to get out of it? Why are they throwing the scenario? Is the scenario deliberately don't move them or move them? Act fast, don't act fast, and that can all come from your scene setting. And then, likewise, people, you know, it's always fascinating to throw in, you know, if you think about a, a train crash or a car crash or a terrorist incident or whatever, the people involved in that bring their life and bring their medical conditions to it. So, of course, you can have a diabetic in the middle of a terror attack. You could have a diabetic who is uninjured, but because of the adrenaline of being in the middle of a terror attack, has burnt off the remaining sugar they had, and now diabetically unwell or you can have someone who's got a weak heart who's caught in the middle of something horrendous and end up medically unwell and so many people just think trauma 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 it's a car crash so everyone's going to be mangled it's a train crash so everyone's going to be mangled what about the guy three coaches down that hasn't come off the rails that's so upset by what's gone on he's now got a cardiac event because it's throwing his stress through the window or this sort of stuff so you can put in medical patients into these type of scenarios and again, the treatment team will know that and brief you, or the, the exercise team will know that and brief you, but then you've got to make them look medically unwell without blood, yeah. which is where decent makeup skills really come into it when you start to make people look pale, sweaty. Absolutely. Some of those are the hardest to carry effective skin tones off really well compared to throwing lots of blood around, which actually is, as you know, hygiene mistakes that can make things look... Yeah, yeah. Like one of the questions I remember somewhere we mentioned is like, uh, what does uh, shock look like? on someone who's got a fake tan i'm like do you know what i don't know but that's a very good point point. and it's like someone's in someone in a bikini that's been stabbed or something for example you may be completely immersed in doing a beautiful wound and it's a nice cut and it looks beautiful edges and you've matched the skin tone flawlessly but they don't look like they've been stabbed because they should be in shock and they've gone pale they're blanched they've got cyanosis and all that stuff is a much bigger job yeah. than the little wound and and clinically far less important because and Again, if it's if it's above the nipple, it's a completely different colour fish than if it's below you know, yeah. And I think it's nipple. I think it's it's and where do you stop? So it's it's interesting you bring that up because most of the time, even when you're looking at you know in trauma, they go down to as we said to these sort of semi naked cut downs or in acting world anyway, it's down to underwear type cut downs. Real medicine, it might be a naked cut down, but even if you've got someone who is deeply cyanosed, which is the far end of of shock then you're not, we don't never have the time to make someone whole body pale um, because you just, A, don't have the time and literally you'd want an air gun, you know, they, you know with a little blender, it's just never going to happen. So what we tend to do from a medical perspective is get the message across on the first arrival of the clinician. So I will do, my patient ideally will be clothed and I will do hands and face and I'll bring the the face cyanosis down below the neckline of, of whatever they're wearing and then subtly blend it out to normal skin so tone. Very briefly, what do you mean? You just pale them up with a, with a foundation? So we tend to use, um, I tend to use some of the Ben Nye colouring. So Ben Nye cyanotic blue tends to be pretty much the best out there for making people look, you know, when you start, you start with clown white and you know it's a clown white. So Ben Nye cyanotic blue is really useful. Plus Ben Nye do their death wheel, which has a variety of, of skin tones past cyanosis and heading into really poorly um like really really poorly and then dead very poorly um so i think it's you know a variety of those sort of cream wheels and um colorings can be highly useful and then following that sort of methodology that the pink bits go most blue so the skin tone can be drained and not white but heading towards a a very very light blue and then emphasizing you know if someone's got a big red nose and big red cheeks and big red ears, well, they'll go bluer. Their lips go blue. So the bits that are pinkest go bluest. So that nice sort of bend nice cyanotic blue brings them down. And then we tend to use sort of some of the mauves from some of the bruise wheels and do lips, cheeks, ears, under eyes. You're not creating black eyes. You're creating that sort of subtle mm-hmm. color change where someone looks really poorly. And another, um, yeah, this was another thing that someone said the other day. Um, someone came on one of the little workshops I run for medical moulage and they were very used to screen effects and stage effects so their their sort of poorly purple blending into the cyanotic blue was very definitive it was dead straight lines which from 50 foot looked amazing because they were used to people being on a stage and the audience being 50 foot away Mm -hmm. but all medical works close up so it's a bit like your work it's got to look almost photographically perfect because your clinician is going to be nose to nose so you can't have those very obvious lines you've got to blend all those tones away as best you can but you can't pale a whole body up. So we tend to bring 
the cyanotic down below the neckline of the clothes they're wearing. And then, so you don't end up with that awful t-shirt line, like a farmer tan of cyanosis, just drifted off mm -hmm. because you've created the, on arrival, the clinician's gone, look at my patient, they're shocked. So they've already got that trigger. They don't need to close, cut their clothes off to see pale. Their face, their hands have, have said to them, yep, my, my patient is cyanotic. They are very poorly. Mm -hmm. They're either low on blood, low on oxygen. Something is significantly centrally wrong with my patient. It's just worth pointing out. I mean, um, because there was a time I, I remember not knowing this. When we say shock, we just don't mean someone is surprised shock. We actually mean a physical condition where the body goes into shock. Yep. Just to make that distinction. Yeah, no, sorry. There's, it's about the worst terminology thing taught in basic first aid and medicine and such like. But the first of all, you can rip into two. So the word shock, you can have medical shock. You can have boo. Oh, I'm shocked. You know, And that's not medical shock. That's a, it's like a surprise. Mm. So then when you look at medical shock, you can rip it again in two. So you take the word shock, rip it in two. One is nothing medical, just a surprise. The other one is rip the word medical shock in two, and you can have psychological shock or medical shock. So, for example, if we are side by side in a car, which has a very nasty accident, but I'm uninjured, but I've seen you splatted, I will be psychologically shocked, which is not boo. You know, I'm actually psychologically damaged. And you might be medically damaged, making you medically shocked. Um, psychological shock and medical shock annoyingly can demonstrate the same symptomology. So, you know, the patient can be pale and sweaty with a rapid pulse rate and a rapid breathing rate and feel nauseous and sick and such like that. So I think it's, it, it, when you arrive on scene, you're trying to always sift, is this a patient who is psychologically shocked or medically shocked? And the definition of medical shock is lack of organ perfusion lack of final circulation oxygen nutrients blood at the tissue and and that's the the end line you know failure of proper perfusion of tissue is what we call it so that's the sort of end line of shock and there's a variety of ways you can get there you can get there because your heart's not pumping correctly you can get there because you've got no blood in you you can get there because you know your your nervous system is not altering your plumbing the way that it does correctly and there's there's fancy medical terminology that you can look at in shock and, and i don't want to bore anyone here with all that stuff because they're interested in makeup not necessarily shock but yes so your patient who is poorly their skin tones change and they change through pale into bluey into dead and dead looks very different from high-end shock as well. And anyone who's seen a dead body will tell you dead bodies look dead. They're not trying to be funny or glib that they do. Mm. And there's, you know, whether you believe, whatever you believe in, whatever entity you believe in, is it the soul leaving or whatever, or is it just the physical shutdown of circulation? But the minute somebody dies, they look very different to even how poorly they were before. Mm. Um, and then you've got obviously the body in states of, you know, first hour, post no circulation, right through to decomposition of whatever eight sweets um depending on where they are in the environment so you've got all those skin tones as well but i think yeah it's it's knowing if you can most clinicians will make that decision they 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 walk up and they they have a thought process as part of their mechanism of injury and it's also a quick eyeball of the patient if you like it's that gut reaction of the clinician is like how they're breathing what's their conscious state and what's their color because if someone sat there with a dreadful color struggling to breathe semi-conscious you've got a big problem mm -hmm. as opposed to someone sat there with beautiful pink skin happy looks at you talks to you is breathing normally you, you know your problem your, your sort of spider senses go down a little bit your 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 index of suspicion as we call it drops a bit so that if you can get the skin tone right you don't have to worry about the naked cut down they'll have got it on arrival you know the hands and face are enough for them to have got it just don't leave the farmer tan line because it looks interesting and, and as well setting the scene you know think about um clothes if you've got a stab wound through clothes then take the clothes and just stab them with a blade don't take a pair of scissors and cut an oval in it because it won't be an oval cut out seeing the wound through it yeah and clothes move so there's nothing better than imagining someone in a fight and if someone's in a fight and they're having their shirt pulled halfway up their head and then someone stabs them behind their back and pulls a knife out and then drops the shirt down well the stab wound in the shirt might be at belt level because at the time the knife went in, it was pulled over his head at the time. He's then pulled his shirt down and staggered away. He's got a stab between his shoulder blades and the hole is, the slit in his shirt is down by his, his um, belt. So you can't necessarily rely on clothes. And again, that 
it adds to the false picture if you have you know the jumper or the shirt with an oval cut out of it which you can see the wound through that's yeah. never the case because they're thinking in terms of i want my makeup to be seen yeah and it's like no that the, there is value in in the clinician having to find this yeah because because that's real life know, real yeah. life you don't have a big sort of neon sign pointing towards the mm. the hole mm. um and things can move and people can put extra layers on or take layers off and they can take away it's, again it's a bit like being a detective they can take away your hints and, and ticks and most people you know will put on a shirt and cut it and then soak it in blood and a simple stab wound might not bleed that much mm. and if there's multiple layers of clothing then the inner layers will soak it up and it won't necessarily be on the outer layer and you can just end up looking for a slit and that's why in trauma it tends to be the naked cut down big pair of scissors up through everything get to skin level because at skin level you can then see where are these wounds what do they look like what patterns are they in how they've been created and that's how you find all the wounds um so setting your scene to make sure that you give the clinicians coming in the best mechanism injury portfolio they can and most realistic mm. and then the final piece is again back to the actor safety just make sure that this scene what is the real impact on the actor you know are you balancing them teetering them somewhere crazy over pointy railings if it goes wrong actually they can impale themselves on the railings and suddenly it starts to become a real scenario you asking them to be in unstable wreckage that actually is unstable and shouldn't be so again your scene wants to be a bit like disneyland it wants to look horrendous but mm. be ultimately safe in the background mm. and sometimes especially the people running it if they're in you know in, in a service themselves can be really quite keen to make this the best thing ever and and as, as pre-hospital practitioners, you tend to do constant dynamic risk assessments anyway, so you're a little bit less risk-averse than some people are, so you push the boundaries, and you sometimes you have to, even you know in that role, I've been guilty myself, and you have to take a step back and go, hang on a minute, is this really safe? You know, I'm putting this person in a pipe, and I'm going to flood it to neck deep. Am I really happy with that? Can it really go wrong? Oh, I'll be fine, I'm sure. And you get excited about the scenario again, you get excited yeah. about the rescue, but you think, no, I'm actually going to flood it, and or I'm putting someone in a car, and they're going to really cut them out live time, but then I've got lots of sharp edges of metal and you know glass that needs to, and and good extrication experts will take care of the glass and take care of the sharp metal because that's part of what they have to do for a real patient. Sure, but you are still sticking a good willing volunteer in a position of risk. Yes, um, and I suppose the final really boring bit about when you do all this is you should have a whole rack of risk assessments written. Yeah, you should be risk assessing what you put on people so you yep. don't get you know the, the compounds you're going to use. And you should be risk assessing what you're doing to people and where yeah, you're putting them. Because that's going to affect your insurance as well. I mean, hopefully nothing will go wrong, but if it does and it hasn't been risk assessed, then it's yeah. suddenly your fault for either neglecting to refuse to do it because you didn't have the risk assessments or they weren't made in the first place. And oftentimes you might turn to the people running it saying, great, can you give me the risk assessments of your exercise? And they'll be like, oh, yeah, I suppose you better write some. Because they get carried away as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can find yourself out on a limb where you've actually hurt an actor and this person was a good willing volunteer, they've rocked up and suddenly they've got, you know, something has gone nasty on the day and and are they looking at you because you put them in that situation? Are they looking at the organisation? Where are they going? And it, and it ends up just being sort of argy-bargy you don't want. And so many people will say, yeah, I'll come along and help you at that scenario. And, you know, you've got that one end of the stick, haven't you? You've got the person with the tissue paper, the latex, the big targets, big holes in the clothes, nothing makes sense, nothing looks appropriate, the blood's all over the floor and it's spraying out in the wrong place using joke shop materials because of cost i understand that but using joke shop materials in the absence of any risk assessments or you've got the other end of the scale where you've got wounds that look appropriate in the right place with the right compounds that survive contact with the enemy you know with the risk assessments in place done well with the right stuff that and people all briefed yeah and again pays your money takes your choice and it's important that this money spent in the right place because oftentimes it's the public purse yeah but it, it's about you know as i say you can get really passionate about it. If you if you get it totally right on the day and you see the effect on clinicians, it's awesome. Seriously, Paul, thank you. That was amazing. No, my pleasure. It's 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 a passion of mine. It's something that I love doing. Um, and I just I, I you know, being a clinician, I want clinicians to get the best exercise that they can. But I also want the sort of guys who are so interested in this side, which I am as well. I'm this weird hybrid. I'm really really interested in moonlights and I love it. But obviously, I'm a clinician at heart as well. Um, mm. And I spent a lot of time in pre-hospital medicine, most of it in search and rescue, most of it around the lifeboats. Um, and latterly running some paramedic training and running um, and assisting Bournemouth Uni with some lecturing. And, and you know, so I've, I've got this weird plethora of a mix that I've, I've done bits for so many different people and seen so many different exercises run in so many different ways that if we can get it right 
And if this at all goes out to people and they can then get it right, the clinicians that are coming up, because these are the people that are going to be looking after you when the big bad day comes. So, you know, whether they be police, fire, ambulance, lifeboat, coast guard, lifeguard, mountain rescue, lowland rescue, whomever. And if I've left someone out of that list, I apologize. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's just getting that, that uh, clinician the biggest immersive experience they can. It's the best way forward. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Well, if people want to find out more about you, where can they find you? I lurk. Uh, so you'll find me lurking on Twitter. So you can, my company's name is Savior Medical. Um, so you can find me at Savior Medical on Twitter. So I think it comes up with my name, Paul Savage, but also the actual handle is at Savior Medical. And then, yeah, we've got a website. So that's www.saviormedical.com, which I don't know, which you put a little link to that in the bottom of your podcast. I'll put some, I'll put that in the show notes. Definitely. Bless you. In the show notes. Yes. Um, but no, if people want to get in touch, they want any help. We do run some workshops. We run some specific medical moulage workshops down in Dorset or we'll come to you. Um, but yeah. And if anyone in the States is listening, I love a trip to the States. So yeah, that's fine. You know, get enough of your friends together to make it commercially viable. Let's come over and, uh, and help you guys out as well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we'll come across the pond. We go anywhere. We don't mind. We'll come anywhere. But, um, I say we, me, I'll go anywhere, but yeah, it is, it is what it is, but feel free to have a look at the website. There's some information on there. Feel free to have a look on Twitter and you'll see some of the stuff that, uh, people, I tend to end up, uh, teaching a lot of clinicians as well, and they can produce some amazing work after just a couple of days, um, just using sort of flat mold systems and stuff, but they've got the benefit of knowing the wounds in the first place. They mm. have to learn the process of makeup or we can flip that and we can, you know, let people who know the process of makeup then produce really realistic wounds by assisting them with the clinical side as well. Yeah. It's, a, it's a two-edged sword. Amazing. Because it seems to me you get that with the, uh, I know they do some, on most degrees, there is some kind of level of anatomy and physiology, but I think it's quite dry. It's just, this is what this is, this is what that does. But there's no discussion about what happens to it when it gets smashed or pulped or burnt or what would be an appropriate level of redness or bruising or whatever, because it's limited to an experience of those things. And I guess people can go out and find reference, but I think more often than not, they try and find something that they like that supports what they imagine it is because they haven't yes. actually dealt with the real treatment. And I think that's the cut point of view. You're coming from the clinician point of view. And we're sort of working towards a middle ground where I'm, I'm always, every time I speak to you, I'm always learning more. And it's just like this nice thing where you go, shit, you need this quite a lot more to know. That's got nothing to do with brushes and palettes. That's yeah. crucial to get first, right first. I think it's, it is, you know, it is fascinating. It is, it is trying to get that, that happy mix between, you know, appropriate, Moulage, and I, and I think you're right. You know, the trouble is most people's reference material is Kill Bill or you know um, other people's latest, makeups. That's yeah, the, the latest sort of gore that's on the television or video games, and they can take to textbook. But textbook is oftentimes very, very flat because it's a single snapshot in time if it's an image. And you know, like the textbook you've got with some of the, the sort of battle stuff is is great, but that's great if you're running a military scenario. Mm. That's not great for Granny at the bottom of the stairs because she hasn't got battlefield wounds. And the trouble is these days, actually getting stock images is really, really difficult because um, with all the medical confidentiality that's appropriate, um, go back 10 years when we started to all have mobile phones in our pockets with cameras on, even as clinicians, you might take a picture of the scene or a picture of the patient's wound appropriately to show up the food chain as you passed it on to bigger grown-ups all the way up the system. Um, and it was not unknown for people to go to hospital and say, look, this is a picture of the car wreck. This is what I dug them out of. So they, again, the clinician in hospital can get a concept of mechanism of injury that's been denied to them because they've never been to the scene, for example. But these days, that's totally not acceptable. And unfortunately, too many pictures started doing circulations and rounds and social media and all this sort of stuff. So there's an ultimate, ultimate ban. You know, it's a hanging offence. You don't take images on scene as a clinician. You don't take images of wounds, etc., etc. It's just not done anymore. Um, and therefore, that lovely stock of images is just disappearing. Um, and so actually getting decent images to work from and decent reference images is really hard. Mm. Um, so I understand why you then pulled back to, you know, the TV and this sort of stuff. But even, um, it's not a plug. I mean, I went around there for the first time myself with my daughter who's at med school. But we went to um, Body World or Body Works, the exhibition in Yeah, London. Gunter van Hagen's. Yes, uh, with his yeah, plastinated bodies. And you get in there and even if you make up artists, it's quite expensive. Even as a student, it's sort of 25 quid to go around. But if you are in London, it's invaluable. And this isn't a meaningful plug for it, but it's just, it's invaluable because you go in and go, ah, oh, okay, that is the size then of the bone in my leg. Because most people, you know, might put a bone that's hanging out your leg half the actual diameter of, of the actual bone that's in there, or it yeah. might be too big. 
So it's important to know how big is the bone in somebody's thigh. In an adult thigh, what is the size of that bone? Because most of our skeletons, we joked earlier on, you know, there's no yeah. such thing as big boned. We're all pretty much the same size inside. So if you want a rib poking out, what's the dimensions of a rib? If you want an upper arm bone poking out of somebody's skin, what is the actual dimension? And then you can say, you can go and look at the skeletons and go, oh, okay, so it's about a centimeter, half, two centimeters, right. So when I poke something out, it'll be that size. I won't poke something out, and I know I'm taking it to the far end here, but I won't poke something out of somebody's thigh the size of a drinking straw, because that's not the size of the bone in it. Um, and, and going around there, it gives you some great concepts of circulation. You can see how tiny the plumbing is, how diffuse it is, um, especially when you come to major vessels. And you can see there's a beautiful um, plastination of the arteries and vessels of the face, and you understand how and why we blush and get hot and go red and our heads glow, and why head injuries do bleed scalp injuries bleed profusely because of the amount of tiny bluffers they've got the big ones but they've got so many tiny ones compared to your normal skin and you can see that on models and start to put the pieces of the jigsaw together so if they happen to be in london it's worth the trip around for sure um it does give you that 3d nature mm. and that actual size that you sometimes can't get from textbook and you sometimes can't get from from movie especially um and quite rightly so most images of people at what's a really bad time in their life are, are restricted and not out there in public circulation and that's appropriate but it doesn't help people who want to learn and come up the right way it's interesting to have someone that you know knows like proper ground up stuff like that as well as the makeup side of things it's really quite lovely to have sat and chat with them about that so that was nice so thank you paul for giving up your time like that that was a, a good chat I, I enjoyed it and i learned a lot too so hopefully that will be of use and interest to you guys too yeah um, it was I, I got a lot out of it so don't forget you can track us down on Facebook we're on Facebook on Instagram and you can email us direct uh, here at Stuart and Todd at gmail.com yeah we would love to hear from you and give us suggestions of things you'd like to hear us talk about we can dish we can dish as good as as good as anybody I think absolutely we just got to remember to clean those dishes afterwards but um I'll probably cut that out because that was the shittest joke I've ever made in my life. Um, yeah, so tomorrow back to work. Um, now the kids are back at school, so I'll be able to get back on to other things. And I'm guessing you're going to be uh, yep. deep, and, waist deep in... in, in, um, in, in beauty your, and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast stuff. Are you on the beauty stuff now or the beasty stuff now? I'm on <laughs> I'm all, all beasty stuff. Uh, but I'm also doing Lumiere and uh, building some some kitchen items for the Be Our Guest number. This is going to be a pretty big production. Fantastic. I'll have to send some pictures up when you're done. Can you put some pictures? Will you be able to get photos for the... For oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I plan on getting... Once we... When you go into full full dress, I want to get pictures of everything because we've got... I have, I've had to do toes for the beast as his feet burst out of his boots and mm -hmm. uh, hands, and it's a lot of a lot of stuff to build, and it's going to look great. Amazing! Well, that's cool. Well, it's been very busy. I mean, I know we've uh, been quiet on the podcast front, but <clears throat> it's not. Um, excuse me. <coughs> it's because I've got a cold. No, it's because th there's been so many other things going on, um, and work-wise, especially. Neither of us have slowed down. And it's like everything's been like keeping our, our tools sharp, you know. There's, there's things happening, and I, one of the things I've done, which I've got to put together, is I, I shot some video. Uh, I think I may have mentioned it before. Uh, a lady called Helen McKenna, who was uh, she sculpted a head when she did a Don Lanning sculpting course. So mm. she had this cyclops head, and uh, she wanted to mold it. So I was like, oh, that'd be a fun thing. So if you don't mind, maybe we we video the molding process, then we'll do it here at the workshop. She was nervous about making a mold in resin and stuff because she'd not done that before. I was like, oh, well, well, if we do it here, then we can video it. I don't mind helping you out. And it took us probably about four days to do everything. So we molded it in two parts in epoxy and then did a brush on silicon on the inside and then filled it with a, you know, soft foam. And then she got her head out so she's going to start painting on that. So I, I videoed the whole thing. Um, cool. So I need to put that out. I've also videoed, uh, we did a brush up silicon mold tutorial for the number 15 prosthetics magazine. Which at yeah, the, the brush of, up uh, a recording we haven't uh, that hasn't come out yet, but that'll come out soon. But I did video for that, which I haven't had time to edit yet. So there's all this video stuff that I have done that we need to put out, but it hasn't been done. Yet. I haven't edited it down, but it hasn't been done. So the quiet 
on the podcast front is an indication of a lack of commitment on either our parts for like now we don't do effects anymore it's just been really busy doing the job and doing stuff and not actually been able to get near a microphone yeah so, yeah so there is stuff to well we'll out, rectify and, that and it will hmm? we'll rectify that we'll rectify that and like i say once this um this website goes up then there'll be a lot more focus on that stuff but i have so many ideas i'm so excited about i've got so many things we want to sit and chat about we need to get we, we, i mean we we keep doing interview stuff but we, we we need to do some more with just you and me talking about stuff and digging deep but every time i do a job or i go on a workshop or i talk to people like i, I have another 20 ideas of things that would make great podcasts but oh yeah just need to get them out and uh, and do them so yeah i think so we talked about a, talked about a few ideas just before we started recording this yeah, man, I'll be. I'm very excited about all that. So, cool. yes, well, it is happening. Stay still, tuned, so. everybody. We got some. We hope fun things coming down the pike for you. Nice one, Todd. Yeah, Stuart, I love it. All right, uh, oh, and we and we got um, you know some some swag. We once the website's up, we might be able to. We got some some things people might be interested in getting their hands on. Absolutely, I still need to get. Uh, you know, you you know, you sent me one of the things. <laughs> I've got it. But it's it's being held. Uh, I need to pick it up from the thing because there's an income uh, customs duty I've got to pay on it. Seriously? Seriously. There's such bastards. You paid to ship it. And before they release it, they, I've got to pay some some 25 quid or whatever. Those fuckers. Income excise duty stuff. So I need to do <laughs> God. Yeah. But, here's, um, here's a gift. It's going to cost you. <laughs> Yeah, they they pay you know they charge you Bastards. one end and then charge you the other. It's it's, it's shitty. So, uh, but I'll, I'll sort that out this week and get that. But uh, yeah, no, I've I've had some t-shirts printed up. We've had some workshop aprons printed up. So it's all there in in, in its bag, nice and clean and tidy, away from the mess in my workshop. But uh, we just need this website up and running. But uh, it'll happen and it's it's coming. So yeah, boy. It's, uh, alrighty. Well, have a good one, man. Good to speak. Thanks to you. you too. I'll talk to you soon. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.